Okay. So today we're going to, so last night, so I was telling Jake here a second ago, um, we're just going to, I intended on flip-flopping yesterday's stuff with today's stuff because um, I realized that yesterday's stuff is better for in-class <clears throat> um, and today's stuff is better really, well, it, today's stuff can be covered also today so I just some kind of uh, just kind of just lump it in because it's just going over the publications and stuff but yesterday's stuff which was the takeoff performance and route performance and landing performance and stuff that is kind of stuff I wanted to show you in class to be able to kind of like demonstrate a lot of that stuff um, anyway so what we're going to quickly go over here first is this is uh, basically publications or um, communications and things like that between um, <clears throat> like what how dispatchers get their information and how um, we communicate that information to our crews just get this set up there <clears throat> So, so first we're going to look at the sources of flight information that we have available to us as dispatchers. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is a, an FAA published document. It's basically more like a book, but they are called airport facility directories. Has anybody ever heard of one of those? Um, you'll either hear people call it the airport facility directory or you'll just you know, of course, our lovely acronyms that we have, they'll just call it the AFD. <clears throat> now, the AFD, as far as the United States goes and the FAA goes, it has several different versions, and each each version of the AFD, well, there's I should say there's different um sections of it that cover different sections of the United States. As you can see, like on this one here, this basically covers the northeastern part of the United States. So all of those states that you can see there, it's basically covering any airport in any of those states. And what the airport facility directory does is it basically tells you all of the information about any given airport in any part of that area. It, uh, you know, it'll give phone numbers, it'll tell you runways, like how many runways, the runway lengths, the available types of instrument approaches. It'll tell you um, their, air, their airport fire and rescue availability, um, which is something that, you know, we'll, uh, we'll kind of briefly talk about. But uh, they refer to that as ARF, A-R-F-F. That's an acronym that you're gonna want to know. Maybe write that one down. <clears throat> Stands for Airport Rescue and Firefighting. But you'll just hear it called ARF. And when they talk about ARF, um, each airport is assigned or given, <clears throat> I shouldn't say assigned, but each airport has what's called an ARF index. Um, and within that, that index, what that means is what that airport's capability of, you know, their services is for, um, you know, firefighting and, and rescue type capability. So if, as an example, you know, we always like to talk about St. George here. So here in St. George, I'd have to look it up, but just, just to kind of give you an example of ARF indexes. Like um, St. George's operations, their commercial operations, I think what we have, what, six or seven flights a day in and out of here. Um, so the airport firefighting and, and their, their rescue operations are basically set up to be able to handle the amount of commercial flights that they have coming in and out. And that's basically that they have at any given time when a flight is arriving, they have personnel, you know, at the airport fire department on staff 
and like you know firefighting trucks available to respond if one of those CRJ 200s you know which would only have a max of 50 people in them at any given time were to have some sort of an incident on the runway or nearby you know they would be the the department that obviously would respond to that so now if you compare that to something like let's just compare it to Salt Lake City so Salt Lake City due to the amount of volume they have of flights they have obviously a much bigger fire department operation they actually have a couple of fire departments on on the field so you know one down more in the cargo area one more midfield by the Skywest hangars there um, and so they are able to have more services available because obviously there's just more flights you know so the St. George capabilities would not be sufficient to handle Salt Lake's you know commercial op flight operations so basically what it, this is saying what an ARF index is is their capability to handle um, that they have to have a certain amount of level of staff for any given flight when it arrives so if they don't have that on hand then we're technically not supposed to operate um, one part 121 operations into and out of the airport without verifying that the ARF staffing will be available when we arrive and when we take off. So sometimes when we do these like little, like these, especially these little, really small podunk towns that we fly to, like in North Dakota and stuff, where we just have like a flight or two a day that are even much less than even say St. George, a lot of times those fire departments at those airports are literally only there 15 minutes before we're scheduled to arrive to 15 minutes after they depart. So they have this little window that says, if you are wanting to, if you are a commercial operation wanting to arrive outside of this window, then you need to call to verify ARF availability. Or, you know, to get, like if we wanted to do an extra section that's outside of those times, we would need to call ahead to say Devil's Lake. You know, that's a, probably a really good example of this. Call Devil's Lake or Jamestown, North Dakota, and tell them, hey, we're, you know, United wants us to run an extra section into your town, and, um, you know, except it's going to be at, like, 11 in the morning. So they actually have to get it together there and make sure that they can have ARF staffing there so that they can be on hand when we arrive and depart. Because if they're not there, then we're not authorized to to. That's interesting. I'm from a small town, and I know it's on call, and they don't call them out when the plane's going out. Really? And so, they're just on call in case something happens. They have a police officer who gets a flight. Oh, really? That's not. So what? I mean, we have a lot of airlines that just come through with lots of people. Yeah. So where, where's that at? In Corona, Alaska. Okay. So and they have like, like I mean, they've got like, is it, is it like the like there's a like Alaska 737s yeah. going out of there and stuff. So. Yeah, and I'm not sure what constitutes like if they are close enough, not necessarily fire on the field. Fire miles from the airport. Uh huh. And so, I mean, they have it's all volunteer fire department except for like one or two people that um, have jobs. <laughs> and everyone else just volunteers. And there's probably like 20, 30 people in town that are you know EMT firefighters. Huh. But like, I don't know if they just stay in there close enough. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not sure how it works specifically, but. Um, I know one of the years they do a great big thing where plane crashes and they have to save everybody. Yeah, do the training. Part of it, I don't know. Yeah, and it, and it is a I know. was curious because I think Devil's Lake is probably the same. It's probably a lot of fire department, you know. Like. Yeah, it could be. Like, I'll, uh, I'll bring this up just to give you an example here. Um, let's see. St. George's index is A. So it'll actually say like on the charts. So I'll bring up uh, Jamestown as an example because I know that that one has a uh, little note.
Okay, let me just... Anyway, sorry, I'm late. Huh. My no phone decided to, like, I can't believe I actually woke up. I woke up, and my phone is, like, like the hello thing for activation. So, like, I had to activate my phone this morning. Oh. Oh, my alarm didn't go off. My phone reset and just, like, made an update in the middle of the night. I didn't wake up. Yeah, it was really weird. I woke up and was like, hello, and then there's like the time, you know, like all the different hellos, and I'm like... It's probably what happens when you give it repeated wire damage. No, this is a, this is a new thing. <laughs> this one's just learning from me, so, yeah. This one has not had a lot of damage yet. You haven't dropped that one in the footage yet? No, I have not. That was my last one. Okay, so... This one just says... So like Jamestown here, I don't know if you guys can see this on this right-hand side down here. This one says, SkyWest has prior authorization from the airport manager to operate in excess of 15 minutes before or after the scheduled arrival. So what that is referring to is the chart right here. Okay, so this is this is a Jeppesen chart here for the airport for Jamestown Airport basically here. So this little thing on the top, this little note says 48 hours prior permission for unscheduled air carrier operations with more than nine passenger seats. Air carrier operations involving aircraft with more than nine passengers not authorized in excess of 15 minutes before or after scheduled arrival departure times without prior coordination with airport manager and confirmation that ARF is available prior to landing or takeoff. So <clears throat> that's just, uh, that's basically what this is talking about. It's just basically coordinating that airport rescue and firefighting services will be available if you plan to have an operation with more than nine passengers. So, so yeah, up there in Cordoba, I'm not sure. Yeah, they, they probably have some way that they're fulfilling this requirement. I'll just message them and ask. Is yeah. curious yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. It'd be interesting to know for yeah. sure. And, and I know that, like, in certain situations, I mean, is there a, do you know if there, is there a fire department on the field? Or is it just? Um, I don't know if they store an old truck, like, in a building there, but I don't, we have one at Six Mile and then in town. So they, they have Huh. Yeah, oh, that's an, yeah. That'd be interesting to know, right. kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of uh, the idea there. So a lot of times we get, you know, crews that will call us. Like, so let's say the Jamestown flight is is running late, which that's never happened, never right? <laughs> so, it, I mean, it, if you think about it, we have flights. You know, it's probably more rare that it's on time than it is, you know late so anyway so a lot of times we'll have crews that will call the dispatcher and say hey I just read this note on the 10-9 chart and this the airport chart here is called a 10-9 chart but they they're reading this note that we just read and then they're kind of freaking out hey do we have permission you know but so we ended up going back in and putting a note on our first chart here we put that note SkyWest has prior authorization, just so they didn't call about it every single time. Um, so did you put your notes into the Jefferson chart, or did you just throw that note in there? And go? So the it? so all of these charts in here. So the first chart, like this one here, this is called the ten seven chart. Mm -hmm. This is a SkyWest specific chart, like, and you can tell that because it'll have the SkyWest logo at the top middle right there. But this is just SkyWest specific information. The rest of these charts in here are the actual JEP charts that are that you know anybody who has JEPs and uh, uh, subscription can see it. But so if you subscribe to Jeppesen charts, if you're an airline and you pay Jeppesen, which for every airline does Jeppesen charts, um, when you use them like that, you have the option to create some of your own individual charts for any given airport, just to throw in like your little information for your for your crews and stuff. So we do that. So every single airport we have will have at least one SkyWest specific chart that's called the 10-7 chart. 
and it just basically has um, it'll have the frequencies for the ops there it'll say whether there's a cars or not um, it'll say who handles their DI services there um, who the ground operator is um, like this one you know it, or Jamestown is handled by SkyWest it'll tell you whether there's AirStar GPU all that stuff so just to kind of you know throw it in there and then it'll tell you what kind of um, procedures the airport has there's no radar there's no approach control radar services there's no ATC tower there is a circling maneuver approach available the runway length is uh, let's see less than 7,000 feet there's no published departure procedure which means there's no SID okay um, and there are restricted areas around the airport and then down here it says no a cars manual manifest must be completed for every flight just so they know ahead of time you know and then it'll tell you what kind of di fluid they have available anyway so this is all just skywest specific the rest of the charts in here are all regular jep charts that are you know they're not skywest specific so let's take a look at devil's lake for just as well while we're at it. So when I bring up Devil's Lake, the very first chart is going to be the Sky West chart here. Same thing. No radar, no approach control radar services, no ATC tower, limited maneuvering, maneuvering airspace around the airport, runway length less than 7,000 feet, restricted areas around. Anyway, this one doesn't have that little note about the prior permission. Let's see if the actual 10-9 airport chart has the little blip about it there. So it does too. Yeah, scheduled air carry operations involving aircraft with more than nine passengers are not authorized in excess of 15 minutes before or after scheduled arrival departure times. So, um, so you you uh, you coordinate that with the airport ops people. You call if there's an airport manager or the, that number, the number to call airport ops will usually be listed in this, uh, in this airport facilities directory. So that's just kind of, you know, uh, an idea of one thing that's in this information here. So, um, you know, obviously we as the operator of these flights are responsible for knowing what services and what the limitations of any given airport is. So the airport facility directory, which really isn't something you're ever going to use, you know, as a dispatcher, it's, it's really more of something you would use if you were, you know, flying around in your own planes, doing IFR flights, you know, not necessarily, a, you know, if you were, well, I guess if you were like a really small commercial operation, but not a 121 operation, obviously all of this information is available to us in easier means than whipping out an airport facilities book, you know, for any given region of the country. But it's just something that they want to make mention in here that the airport facility directory is available to us. Um, and uh, we can look at it if we need. But we have, like I said, we have all of the charts for every single airport in the United States digitally available to us just right on our computers. So that's kind of how we access it anyway. We don't necessarily look in this book, but um, this kind of all breaks up the regions that it's showing you that it covers. So there's a northwest region, a southwest, a north central, south central, east central, southeast, and then northeast. So there's all of those. In order to cover the whole U.S., you got to have what is that? Eight books total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven books. <clears throat> then, of course, we have the federal aviation regulations that we are public and available to us. Um, we're going to go over this more specifically in about a week, but um, the FARs is one of the publications that we use. Um, part one of the FARs is talks about definitions and abbreviations. Part 61 is pilot certifications. 
Part 67 is medical standards. Part 91 is general operating procedures. Part 141 is about flight schools. 142 is training centers. And then NTSB 830 is all about accident information, notification, and reporting. So we're going to go over these more specifically. In fact, we spend a whole day on a day on a couple days on FARs. There's also another book called the Aeronautical Information Manual, or otherwise known as AIM. Sometimes when you see the book for the, like if you buy the book for the FARs, it's usually conjointly published with the AIM. So it'll be called the FAR AIM. You'll usually see it like that. They're both together. All of the FARs and then all of this information is in that book. So the AIM basically talks about what these things are. Not necessarily if airports have them or not, but um, it just tells you what is a navigation aid, what, you know, what the different types of airport lighting, airspace, ATC, ATC procedures, emergency procedures, safety of flight, medical facts, aeronautical charts, and pilot controller glossary. So all of that is found in the Aeronautical Information Manual. Um, really just kind of is a, it's kind of the, the, the FARs and the AIM are just conjointly go together to kind of like help you understand what some of the terms in the FARs are so that you kind of have the, the, uh, this book to look into to like, well, I read this FAR but I don't even understand what those words mean. And then you look it up in the AIM and then it tells you what it is. Kind of, it's kind of how it works. So this uh, next thing here is advisory circulars. So uh, the advisory circulars are documents that are published routinely by the FAA and just depending on like the changes and, and different things going on um, they can publish advisory circulars really whenever they want um, for instance you know the first uh, two weeks that we spent on weather most of that information most of the reading you guys did um, that was from Advisory Circular um, 45. So they, uh, they, the FAA basically published a whole, you know, big advisory circular. That was just one advisory circular. Some are really long, some are really short, depending on the topic. But um, that advisory circular was all about aviation, weather information, and services. So. Um, that's just an idea of what an advisory circular is, but they, they publish advisory circulars on all sorts of different information. Um, you can kind of see here some of the different types of sections or um, subjects, I should say. They have general aircraft, airmen, airspace, general airports, and that's just kind of touching the surface there. Um, as an example, in this class, we uh, we end up talking about oops let me just show you guys you can actually see all of the advisory circulars that we we use as well like in the on the google drive there's actually a folder form but this is just an example of just the ones we use just in this class these are all and this is just a list here and maybe I can show you on the Google Drive. Maybe that would be a little bit better. Um, so that you guys can kind of see how to get into the in, in and out of them. But uh, all I've kind of I've gone in and added a few and stuff and anyway some of these are really old like some of these are from like the 60s and 70s 
and you can kind of tell that just by looking at the cover you know like this one right here is an example I'll just double click and bring this one up this one is from September of 1977 and this is talking about additional weather information for domestic and flag air carriers anyway you can tell this was clearly brought up on a typewriter and but it's talking about you know this is talking about even back then you know like this is talking about clear air turbulence mountain generated turbulence low level wind shear thunderstorm gust fronts I mean so you can you know read this you know I mean this isn't something necessarily we we, we will draw some information in and out of it you know here and there um, but this is uh, you know obviously the older it is like our our thunderstorm information nowadays obviously is a lot better than it was from 1977 so you can only imagine you know that some of this is outdated but they they do like the one that you guys read through this is one of the initial weather advisory circulars that was issued um, one of the big ones that I <clears throat> that you guys went through was this one which is number six and this one was actually published last year so this one um, and, but this one is kind of one that is is a continually modified advisory circular but basically it's just Advisory circulars in general are FAA documents that are put out there to just kind of help learn about aviation topics, whether it be weather or, you know, anything that you can think of that's aviation related that the FAA wants more, you know, people to know more about or become more educated about, they will do an advisory circular. So they're not necessarily, you don't necessarily know when one's coming out. Um, but they'll also go back and they'll take some of the old ones and then they'll modify them and add new information or change information if it's something that is significantly different now from when it was published, like that 1977 one as an example. And they'll change these and modify them and then reissue, you know, the same advisory circular just with a, like an update number on it, which, you know, like, which is the case of like this one here. They initially... This was this was put one of the very first advisory circulars that was ever put out, and it's just called Aviation Weather. But this was like the sixth one that they ever issued. But the most recent version of it was last year. So you can tell that this is one that they're continually going through, making changes, making updates, so that we're not reading information from 1977. You know, kind of the idea there. But this is like this is basically the one that you guys read through. You know, for the most part, I think we probably almost nearly read through every section in this one. Um, I'm sure it looks familiar. A little bit. And then there's um, Advisory Circular 45, which is another supplemental weather one. This is Aviation Weather Services. But this one was also the most recent update was at the end of last year near the end of last year. But advisory circulars are, like I said, they're available. They just publish them out there and it's just updated and, um, you know, new information and education on certain topics. Um, but they are very useful and, you know, they do a lot of study on a lot of these things and they're definitely very beneficial to, to any, you know, whether you be dispatchers or if you're a pilot or air traffic controller, anything FAA related, they are very useful, um, depending especially on certain topics. But, you know, there's certain ones, obviously, that are way more pertinent to dispatch. Um, so you can kind of see there's some other ones here. There's one on wind shear. There's one on operational control. This is one that we are going to go through here later when we get into it this one was put out in 2011 but actually this is operations and icing which um, we do look at a little bit later let's see this one is at dispatch management training resource management let's see 
figure out where my I didn't put that one in there anyway. So there's one on operational control, which is a recent. Let's see, this one was put out at the end of last year as well. And this is part 121 air carrier operational control that will we'll go through this one as well. This one is 25 pages. Once we start kind of talking more about that specific kind of stuff. Uh, wet runway operations, takeoff performance. Um, that's one that we actually will look at a little bit today there. Hazardous mountain winds. Anyway, the ASAP program um, was an advisory circular that's there at the top. So just kind of, that kind of hopefully maybe gives you an idea. But the advisory circular is very useful. Give a lot of information. Oops. Um, Jeppesen Pilot Resource Services, VFR and IFR data. There's the Jeppesen FAR name and the airport directory that we already were kind of looking at. Um, what I was going to do is bring up Sky Vector here for just a minute. Did anybody have a, how many people had a chance to jump into Sky Vector? Take a look at it. It's really cool. And we're gonna we're gonna use it a lot when we get into fly planning planning, but you guys you guys will love it even more than you already do. Let's see here. So I'm gonna bring up that same I'm going to go back to the Jamestown example here for a second. If you ever want to look up an airport in Sky Vector, you just go to the top left-hand corner and just type in the city code and hit go. And it'll actually take you on the map right to where that airport is. Um, it will also list it right up there in the top left. Like once you type it in, hit go, it'll put it right here. So it'll say Jamestown Regional. So you can actually click on that if you want. Oh, maybe it doesn't. Okay, you can. Oh, come on. Okay, so when you go into it, it has that little I button, that little lowercase I. You can click on that, and it'll take you into this page right here. So this page is just telling you all about the airport. But this top left-hand corner up here where it says chart supplement, and if you if you just scroll over it, it'll actually do this little pop-out chart right here. This right here, this little chart that it's popping out for you, this is literally the page from the airport facilities directory that's just they took a you know a copy of and they put it into Sky Vector. So this is like access to the AFD just directly in Sky Vector. So if you just like I said, if you just kind of take your mouse and highlight, go over that chart supplement, it pops it all out. But this is literally what the AFD page looks like for Jamestown. I'm going to try and scroll down. It just gives all of these uh, the different information here. So you bring up if you bring it. So if you can imagine if you open up the AFD, you open up to Jamestown Regional here. Um, you go through it here. It tells you what the the airport identifier is, JMS or KJMS is technically the official one. It tells you what time it is, and this is so UTC minus six. So Talking about Zulu time here, it's basically um, Zulu, you know, minus six. Oops. Um, so it tells you, uh, you know, part of oh gosh, let's down it. So part of the year it's minus six, and then part of the year it's minus five once you're in daylight savings time. It tells you where it's located uh, via coordinates there. Um, it tells you here the ARF index, but see in this case, 
it uh, is telling you, so it's a B ARF index, and I don't remember the specific, the, you know, what Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, um, what they mean or, you know, what the differences are specifically. I know, I think the lower, like I think A is, just means 24 hour operations. So I don't believe, like the St. George one, to your knowledge, they don't go home at all. They're 24 they, 7, right? They've got someone on call, but they, they leave. They leave, I know okay. That they've got to be able to get to an accident or whatever within two or three minutes, though. Yeah. yeah. So, A, I think, we'll look it up. I'll, I'll bring up, when you guys take your first break, I'll bring, I'll bring up the uh, the different indexes so you guys can know. But uh, J sound is a Bravo ARF index, but then it says C remarks. And that remark I can only assume is going to be that one that tells us, well, it's actually down here. But we'll get to that here in a minute. But this basically tells you all of the different things. The NOTAM file is JMS. Uh, and then it says they have runway 13 and 31, which is... 6,502 feet by 100 feet. That's the dimensions. It is asphalt and it is grooved. So when it refers to like grooved right here, does anybody know what a grooved runway means? Has grooves in it. Has grooves in it. Come on, Correct. But do you know? Can you think of why why would a, why a runway would be grooved, or why it would need to denote this? I guess on a chart. Is it, I don't know if anybody's ever kind of noticed or seen. It's, it's obviously a lot easier to see like when you're in like the jump seat. So you will see it if you haven't. But if you if you've had the opportunity to be out by a runway, most of them, if you look down the center line of a runway, are kind of sloped to the sides, and then they have these grooves in them like every, gosh, I don't know, every six inches or whatever, these little tiny lines that are just... So they do two things. Basically, first of all, it makes better traction for the runway for braking action, things like that. But the primary thing is, is when it rains, the water goes into the grooves, and then it slopes off the runway. So as it rains, it just hits the runway and then just goes off to the sides. It never... It's designed to make it so that it doesn't stay on the runway. Um, so most all major, you know, commercial runways in the United States are grooved, and it'll usually say that. If it's not, it'll tell you that it's not. You know, it'll say non-grooved. But like example in Canada, they don't. I don't believe they have any grooved runways. So we do fly to a lot of places that don't have grooved runways, but they help with, you know, water and traction and things like that. Um, let's see, this next um, part here, some of this stuff is foreign to even me, so we don't ever really use it, but it, uh, the next parts here jump down and it talks about the runway lighting. So it's telling you, um, it's telling you how, like, what kind of lights that it has. So. Runway 13 has runway end indicator lights is what that stands for. And we haven't really totally, I know we looked a little bit at like airport like approach lighting, like what they need for like ILSs and things like that. But we'll look more directly at all of airport like lighting and marking information later on. But this just basically tells you, eventually you'll know all of your different acronyms for lighting. So that's runway end indicator lights. It has a VASI, which is basically, um, it's a vertical alignment situation indicator. And those are kind of just lights on the side of the runway. So as you're approaching the runway, um, there's these lights that you can look at. And depending on your angle of approach to the runway, it'll tell you, if you are like coming in at the right angle or it'll tell you if you're high or it'll tell you if you're low. So there's another system that's just like this that's called a, it's called a PAPI, um, P-A-P-I, and it, it basically does 
kind of the same thing. And um, we'll, we'll look at those lighting things later, but this is just telling you what's available. So this is telling us the glide slope is three degrees. Um, the touchdown, um, let's see, touchdown hold, let's see, is 52 feet. And the threshold, let's see, THC. I'm trying to remember what THC means, TCH. That should be the that should be the the start of the touchdown zone. So this anyway the the runway and like I said same thing we'll be looking at these specific things later. So don't if you don't know what it is don't worry too much right now. But um, it's just basically this section is just referring to what it is, uh, what kind of lighting they have. Same thing with runway 422. It gives the length. That's only 75 feet wide and it's just asphalt. It does not denote that it's grooved. So it's not grooved on this one. It's only 75 feet wide. Um, and then kind of same thing here, it tells you the different types of lights. These um, next little part is the runway declared distance information. And these all are, these little acronyms here are, are things that we look at when we look at performance. So you'll, you'll get to know these acronyms partially today and but over you know the space of flight planning and things like that you'll see these a lot but this stands for takeoff runway available that's TORA and then TODA is takeoff distance available then ASDA is aircraft stopping distance available and LDA is just landing distance available. So you start to look at these and they kind of sound like they're the same thing. But, and if you, you can actually see that the lengths are actually the same here. But a lot of times these will vary. Like sometimes um, you have parts of a runway that are that are available like the this like the total distance of a runway for, that's available for takeoff can be can be longer than what's available for landing and what's available for stopping but we we will look at those but this is basically just telling you those uh, you know what if, if there are any differences for you to refer back to once you guys kind of know what they mean a little bit better um, tells you that you know like here it's telling you the different type of fuel that they have jet a is available that's all we would care about um, the lighting is you can activate the runway lights from like a lot of this, so this airport is basically saying that it has what's called pilot controlled lighting. And so if you guys remember when I was talking about like airports that have no, no towers, like no ATC tower on them, they use what's called a CTAF frequency. Kind of like when I was talking about that, um, um, like that experience I kind of had with, uh, with here in St. George when, you know, when that airport was coming or that airplane was coming up the canyon, we were coming down the canyon and our TCAS went off. They were supposed to be on this CTAF frequency. Like all aircraft that are operating in and around the airport are supposed to report their location on this CTAF frequency because there is no control tower. But also because there's no control tower, um, the pilots are the ones who actually, like if you're coming in at night, the pilots are the ones who actually turn on the uh, approach lights and the runway lights. So what happens is they get on to this CTAF frequency and they click their mic and they can click it different times. Like they can click it three times for like low intensity, uh, five or six times I believe is for medium intensity and that, or they can click it like seven times and it'll turn it on like high intensity. So um, as they're coming into the, to the area, they'll, tune into the CTAF frequency and you'll just, you'll hear, you know, they'll, they'll just go click, click, click. And then, you know, if you're watching, like if you're in the jump seat, it's really kind of cool because 
Um, and I've, I've seen them do it a lot here for St. George, but like once you pass over Cedar, they'll usually click on the runway lights if they're not already on because of somebody else flying around. But if they're not on already, then they'll click them on. But once you even get to, I've even seen them do it before Cedar City. It's kind of cool because you're so high up, you know, your angle of view down, you can still see clear to St. George even before you get over Cedar, but they'll, they'll just get on and click the lights and then you just kind of watch out in the distance because you know it's out there somewhere, the, the runway, and then all of a sudden you just see it light up. And anyway, it looks really cool from up high. Um, so the other thing is too is a lot of like these CTAF frequencies, a lot of these CTAF frequencies are, a lot of airports have the exact same frequency. In fact, typically most airports do have the same frequency unless they are like really close together. Like um, St. George and Cedar City have the exact same CTAF frequency. And the reason why airports do that is because they just want the CTAF to be like a common knowledge. Like they don't want to have pilots think that they need to like go digging through, you know, their charts or dive into the AFD like while they're flying around in order to figure out what a CTAF frequency is. So if it's not located close to another airport, by default, it's usually always going to be like this one here. If you look down a little bit, CTAF Unicom is 123.0. Typically, most are going to usually be the same frequency. So, um, like if you turn on the runway lights for St. George, but you're right over Cedar, even though you're high enough to where your frequency reaches St. George, it also will usually turn on Cedar's lights too. So, kind of just a little side note. Oh, I hate this thing. Um... But you can turn on and off the light. So it's basically telling us that they have pilot-controlled lighting. That's another thing, too, that you'll see as a dispatcher. Like, you'll have a flight going into one of these smaller, non-towered airports, and then you'll have the pilot um, message you and say, the lights aren't turning on. You know, like they're sitting there trying to turn them on, but they're not turning on, you know? So that's something that kind of happens a lot, too, is it's not a perfect system. Then you got the airport remarks. It's attended Monday through Friday from 1400 to 2300 Zulu. For attendant after hours, it gives you the phone number to call. It tells you that fuel, 100 low lead fuel, is available 24 hours with a credit card. There's a 24 hour pilot lounge available. Seems kind of odd. Birds on and on and in vicinity of the airport. Then it's saying 48 hours prior permission for unscheduled air carrier operations with more than 30 passenger seats. Call the airport manager, the phone number. Air carrier involves inv involving aircraft with more than nine passengers are not authorized in excess of 15 minutes before or after scheduled arrival departure times. We already read that note, obviously, on the SkyWest or on the Jefferson chart. So the AFD is obviously just going to be considered the FAA chart. And their note is a little bit different because it says air carry ops with more than 30 passengers just call the airport manager. So that's all we got to do. But it's just saying the ones with nine, between nine and 30 are not authorized in excess of 15 minutes before or after scheduled arrival departure times. Then it gives you the rest of the information here. Airport manager phone number. Weather data sources, it's got the ASOS. It gives you a frequency for the ASOS. It also gives you a phone number to call the ASOS if you want to listen to it, like we do in dispatch. So in dispatch, you'll notice too, like we have um, a list on our phones. Like when you look them up, the dispatchers mostly look them up in the plot because they don't have the nicer new phones that we have over on the system controller and shift manager dispatch soup side. Um, but the dispatchers have like little two digit or three digit speed dials that call pretty much any one of the ASOSs that we fly to. 
So you just have to hurry and look it up. And you look it up like in the plot, it'll say like Jamestown ASOS. It's it's 371. So you just pick up the phone and you dial 371 and it calls the Jamestown ASOS. Um, and you got the high loss frequency there. Um, then you got the CTAP Unicom frequency. Um, you've got the oh, I hate this thing. Um, where were we? So this is basically telling you down here. It's telling you. Um, like the flight service station radio is Grand Forks radio if you want to talk to them. Minneapolis Center is the specific ATC center that handles all approaches and departure control for that airport. So if you're a um, if you're like a SkyWest flight, in order to get clearance, so when you're at a non-towered airport, you have to actually call center because there's not a control tower obviously but you have to call um, whatever center it is that is over that airport and get your clearances from them <coughs> sometimes you probably have been on a flight to and from Salt Lake or really just to Salt Lake I should say or you're taxiing out and they hold for a minute and they said we're just waiting for our clearance that's because they don't have a tower that's just local that can just give it to them. And so they end up calling for St. George. We are in the L.A. Center boundary here. And so they call L.A. Center and they say L.A. Center, SkyWest 7393 on the ground in St. George looking for clearance to Salt Lake. So their flight plan is usually already filed and in the system. So L.A., whoever, you know, answers the frequency call, um, from LA Center, they just bring up Skyway 7393. They see what flight plan they have filed and want to fly. And then it has a proposed departure time in there. And with that, they they basically, they start looking at the traffic that's going over St. George. And then they, they issue them a, a clearance based off of them, you know, taking off and kind of fitting into that stream of traffic that's headed to Salt Lake City. So a lot of times you have to hold on the ground because they uh, they can't like sometimes there's not an opening in the overhead traffic. I mean, if you look at like on Fusion and stuff, I mean, even if you just have SkyWest flights, just SkyWest flights alone, there usually may not even be. I mean, you, we have so much stuff that goes from Southern California up this corridor, and this is this corridor like coming from Southern California over Vegas over St. George is a is a main airway. I mean, it's Commercially, it's, you know, a very, very busy section of, you know, airway. So a lot of times, even though it may not even be planes necessarily going to Salt Lake specifically, but they still have all these planes up in the air, and they have to get a little gap to where they know that they can fit the, the St. George departure into this little stream of traffic. And so you look around, and you don't see people taking off and landing. It doesn't look busy, and, and it just simply comes from not like knowing how it works, but the common person on the airplane wouldn't understand like, oh, I don't see anybody, you know, what are we waiting for traffic-wise? So, um, but typically it's because they got to kind of fit themselves perfectly into a little gap and then get in that little stream and then up to Salt Lake. So, um, but that's LA Center that coordinates that. And so if you don't have a tower at the airport you're going in and out of, it's always going to default to whatever center is that it's the area that it's in basically. So with Jamestown here, they're Minneapolis Center. So when you go in and out of J or Jamestown, you call Minneapolis Center on 124.2 and you get your clearance from them. And then it's telling us that it's Class E airspace. Then it's telling you some of their other things. It's got a VORDME. That's the frequency. Um, they've got an NDB as well. And they've got an ILS DME for runway 31. So it kind of just 
tells you that information of what's available at the airport. So that's what the AFD stuff looks like. I even didn't know this, but over here on the right actually has pictures. Well, that's pretty much exactly what I imagined Jamestown looking like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It has a picture of the above view for the field. If you go back in, if we look at our charts here, back at our Jeppesen charts, um, oh, shoot, they don't have it in here. A lot of, of the Jeppesen charts will actually have like a view of the field, like a like, let me, let me bring up Jackson Hole as an example. Oh, they should have it. Okay, so Jefferson is kind of cool because they actually will do these specific charts that show you the picture of what it looks like when you're approaching the runway. This one I can't, I can't like do the full view, but can you kind of see that? You can see the runway out there. And then if I bring up 19 coming the other direction, it, it shows you kind of what it looks like if you're flying in there during the day, I guess. So anyway, kind of cool. Let's see. So another um, publication that we have available to us are NOTAMs. Um, we're going to get more into, when we do flight planning, we're going to get a lot more in-depth to NOTAMs. But uh, does everyone know what a NOTAM is, right? Notice to airmen. And it just basically talks about specific things at an airport that are either in service or out of service or just things that are um, needed to know by anybody that's going to be operating in and out of the airport. So since we are looking at Jamestown, Jamestown is just going to be our little go-to. We'll just quickly look at the Jamestown Notams. Like I said, though, we are going to be looking at Notams a lot more later on. Actually, you know what, I got the link to it right there. I wonder if this will take me in without having to log in. Yeah, look at that. Let's see here. Text. Oh, yep, of course. I do need to log in. Almost that. Okay. So here are the notums, just basically from where it says D notums, going down here, it'll just basically kind of show us what the different notums are. So notums always start out by saying the airport code, so it's saying JMS there, and then the way we read the notum is 
that this, so this note first off here is going to be, this first thing is going to be the month. 05 is the month that the notum was issued. And then this next number here is going to be the number of the notum that it was issued. So this, if you're looking at this 05 da, or slash 009, it just means that this notum was the ninth notum issued in the month of May. So being a smaller airport, it's not going to have a ton of notums, but if you look at a big airport, you'll see this like, it'll say like 05 and it'll say like 462, you know. So it's just the, what, you know, they're based on the month and then the number for that specific month. So this is telling us um, that Jamestown, so there is, a an obstacle uh, in and around Jamestown which is a tower and it, this is probably in this case it is probably just like a radio antenna type tower but it's a uh, so there's obviously the FAA has specific requirements for any tall obstacles that are in or around airports they have to be lighted so they have little blinking lights on the top of them um, and so this is basically just telling us that one of the towers that's in or around Jamestown, the light is out of service that blinks on the top of the tower. Now, I know you guys see here at night, like over here on, was that Beacon Hill or whatever it's called? The, the lights, you know, the, all the radio antenna towers. So those towers, if one of those lights were out of service, you would see that in a St. George Notum. Just to kind of give you an example. This is kind of something similar to that, although Jamestown doesn't necessarily have mountains and stuff. They still obviously have towers, but uh, they, uh, if you want to know exactly what tower it is, you can look it up with this number right here. There's a, like a file that is kept by the, I don't know if it's the government or if it's like the F, I think it's the FCC that, that logs all of this stuff. But if you go to the FCC website, you can type in this number here and it'll tell you exactly what tower this is and where it's located. So if you care that much to know. As a dispatcher we do not care about this notum at all. Um, so but then gives the coordinates if you want to know and it tells you right here it's 13.6 nautical miles east southeast of Jamestown. So it's really pretty far from the airport. Um, and it is 1,716.9 feet tall. Or, sorry, that's the, that is the MSL, I should say. So that is the elevation, but then this one here, it's only 213 feet above ground. So if you're 13 miles away from the airport and it's still only 200 feet off the ground, then you got a lot bigger problems than this tower. So for us, that's why we don't care. Anyway, just out of service. Next notum, um, same type of deal. The eighth notum for the month of May, Jamestown, obstacle, tower, light. This tower here, which is 17.8 miles uh, west, northwest of Jamestown, 231 feet AGL, out of service. Next one, same thing, another tower. Basically, all the towers around Jamestown. This one. There's so many columns in here, what do my tower or? I believe it's the FCC that notifies the airport. Pretty much every one of their towers, if it's within a certain vicinity of, a, of an airport, then they are automatically given notification. Some of those towers that are just off in the middle of nowhere, they obviously don't report to anybody, but. Um, but yeah, so this one's 5.2 nautical miles east-southeast. This next one, Jamestown Service Hazardous In-Flight Weather Advisory Service Outlet is not working. That is that, if you saw that thing that said high was down here, there's this thing that says high was right there. That is that frequency that it's talking about. Oops. Data service. 
Jamestown uh, 7th Notum, this was issued back in March, but it's clearly still out of service. It's been out of service since March is basically. Runway 22 Pappy is out of service. So we don't usually use 22 there. And then this is, so this is the 27th Notum of September for last year. This is still Jamestown NAB ILS Runway 31. Um, Sabin, it's the left outer marker is out of service. So um, you'll see a lot of these types of notums. This this doesn't necessarily mean that the ILS is out of service. It just means that one of the markers on the ILS is out of service, which it doesn't necessarily take the ILS out. Like we could still use it and fly it all the way down to the regular minimums, but. Um, Anyway, it's just basically telling us that the left, um, or is that the lower lower out of marker, is out of service. Anyway, that's all of the regular notums for Jamestown. Then you have FDC notums. So I'm going to just tell you the difference here, and this is going to be something you want to know. The two different types of notums, D notums and FDC notums. D notums are going to be notums that pertain to airport, to like airport, uh, I should say services, um, or basically things that are out of service or inoperable at the airport, at that specific airport. So you can see notums for a runway being closed. You can see a runway or a, a notum for a VOR being out of service, for an ILS being out of service, plus these things that we just read here, tower lighting, PAPI, um, the high wash radio, any service or ground based navigation aid, um, runway, runway lighting, any service that's at, at an airport that's has an issue or is out of service or inoperable is what would be in a D notum. D notums basically stand for local notums. <clears throat> now on the flip side, FDC notums are also they're just for specific airports so this FDC notums would you know for Jamestown would just be for Jamestown but the only thing that they have to do with are changes to instrument approach procedures so if you just know if you were just to be able to say if I were to ask you what's the difference between a D notum and an FDC notum, a very appropriate answer would just be one is discussing, you know, services that are inoperable or out of service at the airport. The other is FDC is changes to instrument approach procedures. And that's as detailed as you would need to get. Now, when I say changes to instrument approach procedures, it's basically meaning like, you know, if I look up at the chart and I bring up the ILS for, um, for Jamestown to runway 31, and I'm looking at that chart. So that, the ILS is an instrument approach procedure, right? So if I look at the chart and I read that procedure, um, I can see what it is. I can see what the minimums are and, you know, the route that you're supposed to fly. Now, the FDC notum would mean a change to that published procedure. So it means that whatever you see on the chart might be changed from what's currently true. So as an example, this first one here. Now these always these look a little bit different. The first 
one here um, is going to be, so it's basically saying Jamestown Instrument Approach Procedure, Jamestown Regional, Jamestown, North Dakota. And this is basically saying, so the next line is going to be what what instrument approach procedure has the change? And this is referring to the ILS or localizer runway 31. And then it's saying it's amendment number seven echo. And then it's basically telling you below what is being changed. This is saying autopilot coupled approach not authorized below 1900 feet. So if I were to cruise back in here to Jamestown, Oh, I'm on Jackson right now. I'm just going to bring up this approach procedure here. So if I were looking at this approach, I could see, so this is the ILS or localizer runway 3-1. And if I'm just reading through this, uh, you know, a lot of this, I know you guys have kind of looked at this a little bit here. But it's basically just telling us that um, we, once they get below um, 1,900 feet, they don't, and to, for a dispatcher, this isn't going to make any difference you know, uh, as far as you guys go, that specific notum. But it's basically just saying that um, you don't necessarily use your autopilot below 1,900 feet. So it's going to be something for the pilots, obviously, more there. So this next one is also an FTC notum pertaining to ILS or localizer runway 31. This one is telling us procedure, and anytime you see NA in a NOTAM, it means not authorized, okay? That's, that's a good acronym to know with NOTAMs is NA. So procedure not authorized except for aircraft equipped with suitable RNAV system with GPS. So that means, in this situation, that you cannot use that ILS or localizer runway 31 instrument approach procedure unless you have an airplane with suitable RNAV and GPS. That's all it means. Now, in our case, if we're, you know, us, if we're flying to this city, Typically, that's going to be just fine for us. All of our airplanes have RNAV suitable GPS. The only time that it would be an issue for us is let's say you had an MEL on your aircraft that you were dispatching to Jamestown. And let's say you had an, a, an MEL with the GPS out of service, which very plausible, very common. So whatever MEL it is, it's telling you that the GPS is out of service on that aircraft. Well, as a dispatcher, when you're checking your NOTAMs going to, you know, before you send this release to, to go to Jamestown, that should be something that would, should trigger, you know, kind of a, a hey, wait a minute, I've got a GPS email on my flight. This NOTAM is telling me that I can't fly the ILS or localizer runway 31 in Jamestown unless I have GPS. So that would mean to you that if, now, now unless the weather is really bad, they may not necessarily need to have to fly that ILS. The only time you've got to fly an ILS is when, when the weather's crappy, you know, like you're going down to a half mile minimums, you know, if it's snowing there. And I, granted, Jamestown often has horrible weather. I know you guys have seen it. But if it's a normal great day and, you know, your visibility, if you look at your TAF and you can see that your visibility is, you know, going to be fine, you know, then, then this the, – it. it it's something that you want to note, but it may not come into play. You might just be able to use a different instrument approach procedure that has higher um, weather minimums. But if you if it was a bad day and uh, you were expecting that you needed to fly, potentially have to actually utilize the ILS approach and go down to potentially a half mile, then that should be something that be 
you should be saying, hey, uh, I think that we should probably swap aircraft or something, get it into a plane that it has GPS or that doesn't have that MEL. So as we kind of go on, I'm going to try to kind of like throw in examples like this when you see NOTAMs and kind of apply it to MEL so it can kind of start relating a little bit more of what you're actually looking for. Um, that next uh, FTC NOTAM there, same thing, it's for ILS lo or Localizer 3.1 and it's basically, this one is telling us that the MSA, which is the minimum sector altitude from JM, which is the NDB um, for Jamestown, from JM, left outer marker, 360 to 180. So from the north half, basically it's saying from north, if you look, I'm going to bring back this chart back up here for us. If you look at this top right-hand corner up here, and we will brief these charts a little bit more once we, same thing, get into flight planning. We're going to look at these and what all this stuff means. But this top right-hand corner right here is called the minimum, it's basically, it's, it's the MSA, minimum sector altitude for Jamestown. So what this is telling us is that we, if we were to like lose communication or if we were to lose, say, your, um, your reception with the VOR or the ILS or something like that, if you're flying around Jamestown, this circle here represents 25 nautical miles radius from the airport. And what it's telling you is that if you are on this western side of the airport, so anything from 360 to 180 degrees on the west side, or this should technically be, so you can see how these are kind of transverse, like 180 is at the top and 360, it's the reverse of a normal compass. It's basically telling you that if you're tuned into the NDB and you're, you're reading anything from above 360, all the way around to 180, then you are, it means that you're on the west side of the airport, but your minimum safe sector altitude is um, 3,600 feet. So that basically means that you will clear, if you're flying around 25 nautical miles, anywhere from the airport, 25 nautical miles radius going west, that you will clear all obstacles, mountains, towers, terrain. As long as you're at 3,600 feet, you are not going to run into anything. Is that MSL or AGO? That is MSL. And then on the east side of the airport, it's telling us that the minimum, and sorry, that on this chart, the MSA stands for minimum safe altitude. If you see MSA on an en route chart, like those other ones, it stands for minimum sector altitude. So MSA changes depending on what chart you're looking at, but yeah. So minimum um, safe altitude going east of the airport, anything from 181 degrees going all the way back around to 360 is 3,000 feet according to the chart. Now that's if you're looking at the chart. Now this NOTAM is telling us that currently there is a change to that and the MSA from that Jamestown NDB from the 360 to 180, the, the minimum safe altitude is now 3,200 feet. So that's all that that means. It's just changing that one little thing So there must be something that, uh, you know, made it go up 200 feet for whatever reason. Anyway, so that, those are all the FTC notes. But um, like I said, you're going to get a, a lot of practice with NOTAMs. Um, so you'll see, you'll have plenty of opportunity to go through them. You're going to be looking at them for every flight we do. So. Um, 
But NOTAMs are obviously a publication that is available to us that we need to look at. So the, the idea here is that we're kind of just talking about publications and things that are available information-wise that dispatchers have at their disposal to find out about flights and stuff or, you know, find out information about, you know, where you're flying to and things like that. Um, the other flip side of this is communication. Um, the different types of available communication we have available to us to relay any information that we come across to our crews. Obviously, we have um, A cars. You know, if they're flying, we have A cars. Typically, we have A cars if it's as long as there's not an MEL for the A cars. Um, but on most of our flights, we have A cars available. If they're up in the air, we can talk to them. We can relay information to them. Um, if they're still on the ground before they leave, obviously we can call them on the phone, um, or we can, you know, talk to station people to pass on information. We can put information on the release before we send it so that they can read it in the remark section of the release if it's something that we want to communicate to them. Um, if it's something like where you have a plane that doesn't have a cars, um, we have what's called um, air rank radio and Atlanta radio services available that we basically just call in to this service. We can call this company called Air Rink or we can call Atlanta Radio and um, they basically can patch us in over the frequency to talk to any one of our planes wherever they're at. I know you guys have probably seen where we get a, an Atlanta Radio phone call from a crew, you know, calling us. We do call them. That's part of your dispatch training though. Once you actually start your desk training, you actually do a couple of these types of calls to kind of get you used to how it works. And, but we can, if, if we, you know, worst case scenario, if they're not responding to an ACARS or if the ACARS is in-op, um, we can, you know, as a last resort, we can get them, you know, on Delta Radio. So we call it, you'll hear it called Atlanta Radio. You'll also hear it called Delta Radio. It's because that service is provided by Delta. They own that little company. There's another company called Air Rink that also does it. So there's the two and we have access to both of them. Um, but we just call them, they patch us in and we can talk to them. As, the, as they're flying around different areas of the country, the crews are supposed to have one of their radios always monitoring Delta Radio, the Delta Radio frequency or the Air Rink frequency for that geographic region. So as they cross around, it's it's all part of kind of their checklist of flows as they're flying. Okay, now we just passed into this other one, so we need to change our, you know, our monitoring radio over to whatever frequency. So they're always supposed to be monitoring that frequency. So you should always be able to get them. We obviously do have instances where they forget to change over or they are not monitoring or they just flat out do not hear us, you know, that happens, but it's uncommon. Um, yeah, so other than that, let's see here. As far as, what's that? Are the C notams carrying the carrier notam? Um, yeah, but those pretty much don't exist anymore. So you'll never see them. The only notams that you guys will ever see are D notams and FTC notams. We know what those stand for, like that D and that F. So D, it, it's, it's really weird the way they used to do, do these. Uh, it used to stand, there used to be L notams, D notams, and then FTC notams. It used to stand for local, distant, and then FTC is what they were called. Then they got rid of the L notams, which are the local notams, but they took, well, they didn't get rid of them. They basically, they got rid of that category called local notams because they kind of were over, like, kind of covering the same thing as the distant notum. So local were just supposed to just be for an air, just one given airport. Distant notums were supposed to be for a region 
of like airports within a certain region. And then obviously the FTC NOTAMs are the same as they are now, but um, they got rid of the phrase local NOTAMs and they just now call it D NOTAMs, even though they are local NOTAMs. Uh, you know, typical F FAA type move. Yeah. So D stands for distant NOTAMs, but it really is just now for, you'll only see them just for the one airport. You do not see NOTAMs for a region. If you want to look it up for a region, you just simply have to look at every airport individually. So there's no use for us looking. You know, if we want to look at, if we're going to use, say, an, uh, an airport that's close by to our destination as the alternate, then when we bring up our alternate, we just look at the alternate individually on the D NOTAMs just for that airport. But that's kind of what happened. But it stands for distant NOTAMs, but it don't confuse it because it doesn't mean that. So I don't know why they do it that way. but. But when we refer to a D notum now, we just call it a local notum. So, yeah, that's not confusing at all. But you're you're not going to be like quizzed or tested on saying like what is a D notum, other than just if I ask you that, it's just going to be you don't need to say local or distant. You just need to just know that it's it's notums that pertain to like the services the and stuff being available or inoperable or out of service for a given airport. That's all. Um, so as far as regulatory requirements go for communications, um, the FAA, and we're, you're going to see this again once we start covering FARs, but what this is referring to here is there are specific regulatory requirements that are um, that the FAA says as a Part 121 carrier we have to have available to us. So when our flights operate, and I'm just going to cover this briefly, but like I said, you will see this more specifically in an FAR once we cover it, and I'll point it out again. But it's just basically saying that there is an FAR that says that all of our flights that operate as a Part 121 carrier service always have to be within radio coverage. Whether that be ACARS radio coverage that we could text them, you know, in ACARS, or whether that be Atlanta radio or Air Rink radio coverage, it doesn't matter. As long as we have direct two-way communication available with them. So they cannot operate in an area that, that we do not have two-way communication available at all times. So that is an FAR. Like I said, we'll look at the specific number of the FAR later, but that's the regulatory requirement. We also have to have, um, as a Part 121 carrier, we have to have what it says is sufficient enough um, operational control centers throughout our company that allows us to maintain, you know, constant operational control from between the dispatcher and PIC point of view. We have to have enough OCCs or dispatch centers is what the FAA calls them. Um, in order to maintain operational control over our flights. So it's kind of a very vague FAR, and like I said, you'll see this FAR later again as well, but it just basically means, you know, that as long, it's basically left up to each airline to define for themselves. So as long as SkyWest feels like our one OCC is enough to maintain operational control over all of our flights, then we don't need two OCCs, you know, or have another one somewhere else. Is there and, an airline with multiple OCCs? No, not that, that's what I was just going to say. I said I know of no airline that has more than one. So when you leave it up to the airline, obviously it's going to be you know, the minimum amount of OCCs, I'm sure. But on the other hand, too, I, I don't see any issue with maintaining operational control, even once we get to 3,000 flights next year. In that FAR, is there a requirement to have a backup facility? Yes. Yeah. 
So there is a, and you'll see that FAR specifically too once we jump into it. But yeah, there is, um, uh, the, the FAR for like the backup facility is just that it, you have to have enough of those backup facilities to, you know, same deal, maintain operational control in the event of some sort of a local catastrophe. So the backup facility cannot be located within, I think it's two miles, or maybe it's one. I think it's just one mile because the old backup facility, yeah, do you remember where that is? Yeah, it was like right there on 7 the South by Little Caesars. Yeah. yeah. So that that's definitely within a mile. Or well, maybe more than one mile, but it's definitely less than two, right? right. So the new one obviously has got a little bit more of a buffer, but that's if there was a bomb, you know. It can't be like a hundred yards away, you know. It's gonna affect both of them. It's gotta be at a place where, you know, potentially it'll be unaffected from something locally happening. Do they have an emergency command center in FAR or is that just a thing that's going to happen? So it's important to keep all the places um, I don't believe that that's a specific FAR, like, but most just have like that, you know, it's either, a lot of times it's within the OCC itself, like most major airlines have like a central conference room that they just call their emergency command center um, that overlooks their OCC. So in, in our case, you know, we ours is clear down in the basement, but our old one used to be that conference room that is now where Brad's office is. Gotcha. Remember when that was a big conference room? That used to be the EOCC originally. And actually when they were remodeling the EOCC downstairs just like a year or two ago, that while they were remodeling, that became once again the temporary EOCC during the remodel. So it doesn't, there's no requirement on where that needs to be. And like I said, typically at most airlines, it's usually in the same room as the, as the OCC. But in our case, it's down in the bunker. So has anybody ever been in it? Uh, like downstairs? Yeah. 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 Down inside the EOCC. So. Is most so, I mean, since the remodel, has everybody been in it? So you can see like all the TVs around the room and all the little speakers and the microphones and the little clock. So, okay. I was going to say, because everybody hasn't seen it. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a break. Just take 10 minutes. So this is, so the rest of the time we're going to spend is going to be all on performance. Um, so we're going to start getting into this. So the first thing I want you guys to really know about aircraft performance planning um, is that dispatchers plan everything based off of one engine which is going to become very common. You're going to see this over and over and over, but everything we do from takeoff, flying the entire flight, and landing, and even diverting to an alternate or anything else, has to be based on being able to do it only using one engine the entire time. So and that's basically kind of... Um, you know, going back to the whole thing that we talk about redundancy, um, that's kind of the reason why, is that uh, we have to be able to plan on, we basically plan as if, as if we're always going to have an engine fail on us on every single flight. It's kind of as the fail safe, that we'll always have one engine and, uh, you know, it'll be available. So everything we, all of the capabilities that we plan for performance-wise, um, they all have to be able to be done assuming that we only have one engine available to us. So when we plan takeoff, and that's the first thing we're going to talk about is takeoff. When we plan our takeoff weight, um, the whole thing is based off of only one engine. 
going down the runway. So when we talk about these weight restrictions and all these different things that we have all the time, um, you know, where the dispatcher has, um, you know, he puts on a bunch of fuel, the flight's full, um, we have a jump seater, we have, you know, all of these different scenarios that we talk about, it is all based off of just the one engine. Like the whole weight, the takeoff weight, everything is uh, is not being able to use the, the second engine. So um, if we were able to plan just with two engine performance all the time, we would never be weight restricted. We would never be able to have to bump passengers. We would never have to do anything like that. But because of just the fail safes, we have to plan as if an engine is always going to fail on us. Never usually does. I mean, it does definitely happen, not very often, but um, we, uh, you know, sometimes crews take off and have to shut down an engine for various reasons, you know, mechanical reasons, um, if they over temp an engine, if they have um, high oil, you know, or low oil pressure, high oil pressure, um, or temperature. Um, there's a, a whole slew of reasons, and we've had one engine the other day, or not the other day, it was about a month or two ago now, I guess, but in Chicago, we had an engine that just basically totally exploded. So, um, what plane was that for? That was one of the maintenance guys on it, right? I don't even know. I, it, I can't remember the exact scenario. Yeah, I mean, they were doing something, but the engine basically, um, they called it, they call it an uncontained um, uh, failure is basically. So there's, not that this is related, but they, they refer, like when an engine fails, they, they refer to it as like a contained engine failure or, or an uncontained engine failure. The only difference between those two is that an uncontained engine failure means that parts and stuff went flying out of the engine. So, or like, you know, like you, if you were a passenger and you were looking down at the engine there at the wing, it's like you saw the whole thing like come apart. If it's a contained engine failure, it just means that Nothing really happened. It just, the engine failed. It went out, turned off, whatever. There's a lot of cases where something happens where the crew actually just has to shut down the engine. Like, it's not that the engine failed, but because of whatever's going on, they have to shut it down, like, themselves. You know, if they have a fire or something, the engine may still still be working, but if there's a fire on, like, one of the engines, then the requirement is you got to shut that engine down. You know, you got to cut off the fuel supply, try to get rid of the fire. So multi-engine planes, like say you have the 7 4, do they plan off of one engine or do they plan off multiple or do you have any idea? Um, one engine? You know, I, that's actually a good question. I don't, I, I'm assuming that a multi-engine plane can usually plan on two engines, but I really, I really don't know. I've, I've never, I've never dispatched anything more than two engine, but... I'm pretty sure that they can because, like, I know, like, the a lot of, there's a lot of FARs and restrictions for, like, when you're talking about, like, over water flying and, like, long haul, like, you know, like, uh, yeah, going over the ocean type flying, transatlantic, transpacific flying, yeah, ETOPS. It, uh, it, it, those vary depending on how many engines you have, too, like your, your ETOPS capabilities and things like that. So I'm pretty sure that they do. However, because there's such been such a drive for like you know fuel costs and things like that, all of the new like they don't. They're what there's only like two planes that are even made that still have more than two engines like that are actually still being like people taking delivery of new planes. You know, <laughs> so the A380 is really only one. I mean, they, the 747 is still made, but it's pretty much now only made for cargo operations. I mean, there's a few left that are going to be delivered for passenger operations, but the 747 is basically, I think at the end of next year, the last delivery for passengers. Um, so even like that plane, which is like, you know, the queen of the skies, as they refer to the 747, um, is going away. 
Um, the A380 really isn't that popular. So, I mean, they're like, they cut back production on that. The A340 Airbus really isn't, people don't really order that one anymore. But other than that, I mean, all of the drive really now is for mostly just those nice 787s, A350s, um, you know, these nice new high-performing two-engine planes. Yeah. So all of those are going to be, um, you know, have to plan one-engine performance. Um, and actually, so like just a little side note, what's kind of weird is with the, the 7, the 777 is technically the, the highest rated ETOPS plane. And it's only a two-engine plane, obviously. So it even beats out the some of the three- and four-engine ETOP capabilities. So anyway, so we plan everything based on one engine. Um, we looked the other day at some of these V speeds. Um, now we're going to kind of start putting them into um, kind of a little bit more into practice here. Now some of these you didn't necessarily see. There's there's ones that you kind of need to pay more attention to and ones that you don't. The ones that we listed the other day um, are the ones that are more important. But like just looking at this chart here, this is just kind of describing how a plane goes down the runway um, and the different V speeds that it hits. So, you know, brake release here starts rolling down the runway and there is a speed here, VEF, which is referred to as engine failure speed. Um, this speed basically here is, so between here and here is, so first of all, I mean, if, if you, the way we're trying to look at this, I'm going to just take a step back for a second. The way this whole chart is designed is to kind of show you what, you know, at different stages of the takeoff roll you're going to have. So the whole idea is that if you have an engine failure while you're rolling down the runway for takeoff, that there are certain points at which you're, you're not going fast mm -hmm. enough that you could still technically stop the aircraft with the remaining runway that's available, okay? So these first two speeds that we're looking at here, VEF and specifically V1, the, the one that we're really kind of going to point out here is V1. You can kind of somewhat disregard VEF, and there's a reason I didn't put it on the other sheet the other day too, because we don't really care too much about this. The one we really care about is V1. If the plane is rolling down the runway, if they get V1 is basically it's uh it's your takeoff and on the chart the other day I called it the uh the takeoff uh decision speed okay so that's what you want to remember V1 as and that is something you got to have memorized don't worry about VEF but V1 is takeoff decision speed. And the reason it's called takeoff decision speed is because it is the point along the, the runway that you can still stop the plane if you lost an engine or if some other, even if it's not an engine failure situation, it's basically the point of, you know, <coughs> that you can still decide that if I don't want to take off, as long as I am at or less than V1 speed, I can still stop this plane with the remaining runway that I have in front of me. Now, if you are past V1, then you have to take off because past V1 means that you don't have, you're going too fast and you don't have enough runway left in front of you to stop, to come to a safe stop. So that's kind of what your V1 is. It's not necessarily the speed we take off at. However, 
it's kind of that speed where you decide, okay, are we going to continue or are we going to stop? Now, like I said, there could be an engine failure. There could be even something else. Let's say, let's say a plane, for whatever reason, one of these guys that uh, isn't talking on the CTAF frequency decides to like fly right over the takeoff path. You know, something, it could be even just something dumb. It could be, um, you know, a little, maybe they saw a microburst, you know, or they can see something out in the in front of them that they don't want to take off. It could be a whole slew of reasons, but as long as they are at V1 or less, then they can still stop the plane with the, with the runway available on the runway, or with the remaining runway available. So that's V1, takeoff decision speed. Now, if you're past V1, you're kind of, you know, consider at the point of no return. So past V1, you're going to take off. Whether you had an engine failure or whatever other thing you have in front of you, um, you're, you're, you're going too fast to stop the plane with what's left on the runway. So, um, <clears throat> so your next speed that you get to is VR which is your takeoff rotation speed. Just simply the speed at which they take the yoke and they pull back, which is going to make the elevator angle so that the plane then will start to nose up. So once you pass V1, that's your technically, if you think about going back to talking about your wings and how you create lift, so once you pass V1, you're technically, even at that point, you're, you're producing enough lift to where the plane is pretty much ready to be able to start, you know, elevating itself off the ground. So at VR, um, you're going to start nosing up. You know, it's going to bring that nose off the ground. Still got your wheels, back wheels on the runway. And as you pass VR, um, you hit, and don't worry about the liftoff speed right there. We're skipping from VR and going straight to V2. Once you hit V2, that is the takeoff safety speed. Now, that's based off of, you know, the two engines and everything. So even, well, sorry, even with one engine on V2, it's uh, you're still safe to take off. So V2, all of these speeds are based on only one engine even working in the first place. So... As you get to V2, that's the official speed where, you know, you're safe to lift off the ground, basically, and, and create enough lift to continue flying. If you, if you try and get off the ground before V2, there's a chance that you could, you know, pull up and then, you know, it'll, it'll not be creating enough lift to where it's going to stall that wing lift and it might, you know, make you fall back down to the ground. So V2, remember that one, that's takeoff safety speed, VR, takeoff rotation speed, V1, takeoff decision speed. You might, and so this is, and I don't know if you guys have seen these questions on the ADX, but this, this, this is a lot where you get questions on or at least some questions on at least that I in my experience that I saw on the ADX stuff, you get questions about V speeds, I believe. So it might ask you a question. It seems like a common question was, what speed? At what speed can you still? Um, or something like, at what speed can you still stop the airplane and come to a, com a safe, complete stop on the, you know, on the runway if you decide to abort takeoff. Well, that would be takeoff decision speed or V1. And then I, I saw like a few other questions where it, you know, what speed is referred to as the takeoff safety speed. A lot of people get those mixed up, but V2 is the takeoff safety speed. V1 is the takeoff decision speed. So when you're in the jump seat and you're going down the runway, you're going to notice there's a couple of different call-outs that the pilots make between themselves as they're rolling down the runway. So they release the brake, they go up to you know, their power setting, they start rolling. Once they get to 80 knots, 80 knots is kind of that first call-out. It's not represented by a V-speed, but 80 knots is like the first point where they 
you know, the whoever's not flying the plane will say, you know, 80 knots. He'll just call it out. He'll say 80 knots. And that's just basically kind of, you know, trying to, you know, get everything kind of, you know, just so they know that they're passing that point. Because the other pilot is the one, you know, he's not looking down. He's supposed to be watching the runway. And so the other pilot calls out all of the speeds. So as they go along, the next call out that they're going to have is going to be V1. And they'll just call it out as V1. They don't say the speed or anything. They just say V1. And then the next one would be, they'll just say rotate, which is VR. So the guy flying the plane just will pull back. And then finally they'll say V2. And then we'll lift off. So um, in the CRJ 700, it, it, on this chart, it kind of looks like these speeds are kind of far apart. But just in the, as an example, V1 is usually right around 140 knots per hour. Okay, and now it's going to be different depending on, that's just an average, but it's going to be different on every flight, but it's, as an average, it's usually right around 140, okay, um, normal conditions. VR usually is immediately after V1, like maybe 142, like it's, it's, it's within a second. Like you're, you're basically, normally you hear it like this, V1, rotate, V2. Like that's how quickly it normally, if you're in, you know, if you're sitting in the jump seat observing, that's how quick all three of those normally happen. So really, you know, V1 is basically, you know, if you're, if you're saying V1, as fast as you say V1, you're already going to be saying rotate and V2. But you can't stop. Like if you've said V1, you're past V1 essentially. So they know that they can only stop if, if V1 has not been called out. So just to give you an idea, they're very, very close. Like V1, 140, V2, say 142, and V, or sorry, VR, 142-ish, and V2, like 144, 145. So very, very, very quick is how it happens. So they um, will get off the ground. Um, at that point, um, um, oh yeah. So it's going, let me go back to that eighty knot thing. When they say that the eighty knots, they uh, when that first call out at eighty knots, they will usually respond. Like the guy flying the plane will respond by saying continuing, you know, or aborting. So that's kind of when they try to decide. You know, that's kind of more, it, like I said, it's not a V-speed. 80 knots is not one of the V-speeds. It's just kind of more of like the designated speed that the pilots are monitoring the systems and making sure the thrust on all the systems are, you know, like the one engine thrust, their engine two thrust, that they're within the percentages. They don't have something overheating or overtemping or a caution or a warning message from the ICAST display or, if, you know, any number of things that they're looking for, right? Um, as long as all systems are operating as normal, then they call out 80 knots, and then, you know, the other guy will respond by saying continuing, like, you know, everything's still a go at 80 knots. Um, so they try and do that just to, just to make sure, because if they want to stop the plane, they usually want to stop it before they get to 80 knots, because you're going so fast that even if you start stopping the plane at 80 knots, you're still going to accelerate close to up to probably 130 and approaching that V1 speed. So if you're going to start that braking and, you know, just because of the human, um, you know, reaction time, basically, 80 is kind of that, you know, that number where it's like you, you need to start stopping the plane now if there's something wrong. Technically it's V1, but you got to react before V1 because like I said, if you're saying V1, then you're already passing V1. I mean, if you, you can't stop starting the plane at, 
or sorry, the other way around. You can't start stopping the plane at V1 because you're obviously going to go past V1 at that point. So, um, and it's not like, you know, a plane is not like one of those things where you just like hit the brake either too. So, you know, and do a fishtail and skid off onto the taxiway and try again. So, Anyway, so yeah, that's what the 80 knots is for, but uh, it's just basically they'll say continuing. Now, they have, you know, there's been plenty of cases where they've been going 110, you know, and I see them a lot from the shift manager perspective because anytime somebody aborts a takeoff, they have to call and talk to the shift manager and we have to do a report and send out a notification. So there's two different categories for the aborted takeoffs. There's going to be a, a high-speed abort and a low-speed abort. So if it's a high-speed aborted takeoff, it goes into like a different category of notification level where, you know, it's considered more of a, you know, caution. It sends an email to more people, essentially, higher up. And then I got to talk to the captain, and we have to do like a report, and we have to assess if the passengers got freaked out. And if it's a low-speed abort, then there's usually nothing happens. They can usually just pull off make a, you know, two right-hand turns and go back and take off again. And there's, like I said, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you would abort a takeoff, a lot of which have nothing to do with anything mechanical or anything to do with the airplane at all. It's just, uh, you know, it could be ATC, could tell them to abort takeoff. It could be anything. Um, Did you still file a report if it was aborted on behalf of uh huh. Yeah, we file a report on any aborted takeoff, whether it be so. The thing here's the thing that qualifies as an aborted takeoff too. If they take the runway, it and then don't take off, it's an aborted takeoff. So even if they just pull onto the runway, set the brake, and then don't even power up, and just just turn. Yeah, even if they just stop, like if they time out. Let's say that they took the runway and timed out and never even started their takeoff roll. Is if they took the active runway and then turned off the active runway for any reason, any power setting, it's an aborted takeoff, basically. So every one of those, and I know it probably happens more than we actually get reported to us, but as long as it gets reported to us, then we file a report. So, but the big ones obviously are the high speed aborted takeoffs that are really more, um, and that would be anything over 80 knots is considered a high speed aborted takeoff. It's another thing. So another reason I mentioned the 80 number, if it's high speed abort, you know that it's more than 80. Um, so you'll see that too as a dispatcher, you know, you'll probably get some phone calls say, hey, we just aborted takeoff. And it'll, so a lot of times it'll be you that has to go tell the shift manager, you know, about the situation. If you ever get a high-speed aborted takeoff as a dispatcher, know that you need to keep the pilot on the phone because the pilot has to verbally talk to the shift manager. So a lot of guys just hang up and then go tell, you know, and then we never can get a hold of them again. So just know if you get that phone call or even if you get it in crew support, <laughs> And a crew says, oh, we just aborted takeoff. Because I've seen that happen a lot, too, where they call crew support, and, you know, try and keep them on the phone. Same thing in an emergency situation. If a pilot ever declares an emergency for any reason, keep him on the phone. And he's got to talk to the shift manager on those, too. Um, you'll see him a lot. So going back to this, so we're, we're planning one engine takeoff performance all the time. So that's where we get into limitations. When we say that our takeoff max, you know, takeoff weight capabilities and this and that, everything is, is based off of just one engine working. So we always need to be able to, you know, plan on an engine failing, being able to still have that one engine that's still operating provide us enough power to return, you know, circle back around, return to the field, do whatever we need to do. Now, like I said, we plan the entire flight based on one engine operating. So technically, even if an engine failed, we could still keep going, 
you know, climb all the way up to altitude and fly all the way to our destination with the one engine. We don't ever do that, obviously. If we have an engine failure, it is, it's, uh, constitutes as, uh, you know, as, as them needing to divert to the nearest suitable airport immediately. So um, even though we can do it, we, we always will divert to the nearest airport. So it's kind of a, a catch-22 there because the FAA requires us to plan everything off of one engine, but it also says that if you have a critical engine failure, that the requirement for the FARs is to divert to the nearest suitable airport. You can plan for it, but you can't operate without it. Exactly. So, and that's the thing too. It's it's that you don't. Yeah, you don't. You never would plan to fly an entire flight like that. <coughs> However, in case it happens, you're still able to go until you can get somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just so that you still have the capability of flying. That's all. So that's the first thing with takeoff performance is it's always based off of one engine. So other things that are going to affect takeoff performance are things that we've talked about before. Um, one of the biggest drivers of takeoff performance is going to be weather. So when we're looking at these V-speeds as an example, um, now the V-speeds, you know, you're going to have V-speeds for every flight. And like I say, the ones that you really want to remember are the V1, the VR, and the V2. Um, now, if we are in, you know, now that we're going to apply weather into this whole situation. So if we are in, you know, a, a really hot day, Salt Lake, Denver, high elevation, you know, kind of that same recipe that I've kind of talked about before, hot, you know, they call them hot and high situations, hot temperature, high elevation, um, that is the number one degrader of engine performance when you talk about weather. So all that does is when you have hot and high, um, uh, what can I think, hot and high conditions, it's going to increase those V speeds. It's going to make V1 way further down the runway, you know, all of those things are going to be increased. So the longer you have to stay on the runway, the, you know, the faster you're going to, that basically means the faster you have to go. So the less dense air, So and, and it all kind of makes sense when you start putting the science back into it. High elevation is going to mean less dense air. Heat in general also makes the air less dense, right? So the whole thing comes down to air density. So when you have high elevation to begin with, even on a cold day, you have less dense air than say at sea level. Add the heat into it, you make things even worse, less dense. So if you have really, le you know, the less, more less dense the air is, the faster the airplane has to go down the runway in order to create lift. And so, when you look at this, you know, as an example, I know we've kind of talked about it before, but you take like a place like Denver or Salt Lake. Those, those are just obviously two really good examples. Denver being the worst of the two, um, you know, elevation 5,400 feet above sea level. You look at their runways in Denver. They've got like six or seven runways there. Um, and six of them are 12,000 feet long. And or five of them. Anyway, all of them are 12,000 and one of them is 16,000. So that's just simply because in the middle of summer, you need a really long runway in order to generate the performance on the aircraft to be able to take off. And even with those long runways, we still, on hot and high days um, in Denver, we still take major, you know, performance uh, degradation penalties because you know, we're still planning one engine um, and you, you know even with a 16,000 foot runway you uh, you can't generate the performance that you need to to be able to take all that weight that we like to take with us passenger wise payload cargo fuel the worst ones are like a CRJ 200 flying from Denver 
to somewhere in Oregon, those ones always seem to be the worst ones. You get like a really warm day in Denver, and your Denver-Portland flight, your Denver-Eugene, your Denver-Medford, Redmond, any of those places, or even the other ones like Denver-Bakersfield, Denver-Fresno, those long, those longer 200 flights always really just get hammered. Like, especially in the situations where they're going to like one of those Oregon cities and that city there requires an alternate and you got to add on that. I mean, you can really end up bumping half of the plane just to, you know, be able to leave Denver. It even gets to the point too, where the temperature in any given city, like um, it happens a lot, obviously in the middle of summer for us, like we'll see it in, Phoenix and stuff, but there you also get to a certain temperature where it's um, this, for the CRJ um, planes, they have a temperature that's basically too hot to operate. That they declare that you know once you hit 46.7 degrees Celsius, we don't operate. You know, and it's going to be different for every city. Like the max operating temperature for St. George because of the elevation will be less than Phoenix because Phoenix is lower elevation. So they have a, it's a different temperature for every city, but once you hit that max operating temperature for wherever you're at, you just cannot operate. They, we don't, it's not that the plane wouldn't work, but you know, going back to the whole fact that you're basing it off of one engine, um, it, uh, uh, Canada Air doesn't even make charts that go into those temperatures. So, we don't, you know, we don't have the data available to see what the performance would be at a temperature higher than whatever that temperature is. And that's all based off of the ISA deviations. So ISA plus, I think it's ISA plus 35 is the highest, or maybe it's ISA plus 40. I can't remember. But that's basically the chart that, that we end up looking at. You're going to see these charts later on. But say ISA plus 40 in Phoenix is going to be different than ISA plus 40 in St. George. If that, that's why those temperatures vary, because elevation here makes ISA different in St. George than it is in Phoenix or Vegas or Palm Springs. Those are a lot of the common airports that we can't operate sometimes at. Um, but it's based off of ISA plus 40, whatever that temperature is. That's uh, it ends up being the, the max operating temperature. Anything above that, I should say. Um, so, yeah, it increases your, you know, it can, you know, a hot and high environment can increase your takeoff distance needed by sometimes up to 20, 30 percent. Like you need that much more just to take off. So you look at those big long runways in Denver um, and then you compare that to say like an airport that's at sea level and at sea level the the longest runways you normally see I mean they're usually 10 9,000 10,000 feet I mean you might see an 11,000 foot runway but it's it's not really because it's needed it's just sometimes they just build it that long but like the majority of runways at sea level you can get easily get full aircraft performance um, even on really warm days, um, like in LA as an example, even on a really hot day in LA, just because it's at sea level, it, the temperature really never comes into play. Like you could be up to 35 degrees Celsius, which in Denver would totally kill you, but 35 degrees Celsius in LA because it's at sea level will do nothing to your performance. So just as an example, I mean, it, it'll be a little bit less because of the temperature, but really the big factor is the, uh, the pressure, the elevation pressure. So even St. George, as in, you know, just comparing St. George to Salt Lake, St. George, 2,700 feet elevation, Salt Lake, 4,300 feet. Just, I mean, that's not really a big gap, but CRJ performance here in St. George compared to Salt Lake, just between that, what is that, 15, 1,600 feet difference is, is dramatically, you know, different on the performance. Um, so, yeah, those are the big things that affect takeoff distance, and those things affect 
landing and in route performance as well. Um, they all come into, into play. The other thing with takeoff performance is that you have other factors too that, that kind of start playing in to your performance. So you have, first of all, these V-speeds, which we've looked at. But after you take off, I'm going to try and find a good image here. That's a good one there. Oh, it's tiny. Let's see. Find one that, okay, that's kind of a good one there. Is that showing up big enough for you guys? Yeah. Okay. So, other things that affect takeoff performance are going to be obstacles that are along the takeoff path. So, even though you have you know, your take, you've got your runway and you got your V speeds going down the runway. Other things that are going to affect it, once you take off, you still have to be able to maintain the performance to clear any obstacles that are in or around the airport along your takeoff path. So, this kind of brings along a whole different set of problems for us. Um, Typically, they like to build airports to where you don't have any obstacles that you're going to have to try and clear. But as you're, as you're taking off, you have to be able to clear all obstacles by 100 feet. Okay, so that's kind of like a, kind of that key clearance number. So remember, takeoff performance related to obstacles is that you need to be able to clear all obstacles by 100 feet as you're taking off, or as you're climbing out, I should say. So this kind of illustrates here, as you take off, start going up. This is a radio antenna, obviously here, or whatever I believe is supposed to be shown. So this is showing you the basically the two or three different um, flight paths here that, that the plane takes. So initially when a plane takes off, it takes off and the initial climb after you rotate and lift off the runway is going to be steeper than your second. So if you kind of look at this, this, this higher angled part right here, that is called your first stage climb. And your first stage is always going to be steeper and, you know, you're going to be trying to get up, up higher as fast as, you know, well, not as fast as you can, but you're trying to climb up and get altitude at a higher degree, higher, you know, rate of climb than, than later on. Um, this next part here, from like here on up is called your second stage. And basically what happens is, and like I say, you can see all of this stuff a lot better when you're in the jump seat and you can feel it and kind of see the procedures. But even if you're riding in the back trying to notice, you can kind of see these things. You always feel that the steepest part is right after you take off going up, right? Kind of feels like that's when you're most kind of like back and, you know, being pushed into your seat. So you take off. That's also for me. It's the easiest time to fall asleep. I don't know why, but like when you're being forced back, like if I don't fall asleep right there, then I'm not going to fall asleep. Like I don't know. That's just me. But anyway, so as you're climbing out, you'll always feel them take off really steep, and then once they get to a certain altitude, they kind of sort of level off for a second like this, like this shows, and then they start their second stage climb. 
which is going to be a lower angle and uh, you know not as not as quickly you know not not as high of a rate of climb basically. But basically, the, the idea behind this is, is you want to get altitude as quickly as possible to be able to maintain clearance over all obstacles in the vicinity of the airport. So if you do have obstacles in the vicinity of the airport, those can end up degrading your takeoff performance. So just taking this example, um, these obstacles here, I don't know, you know, I guess if these are supposed to be mountains or whatever, but if you have let's just call this a radio antenna <coughs> if you're taking off this direction on this runway that has a radio antenna nearby and it doesn't even it's not necessarily saying that this radio antenna is straight off the runway it's just if it's within a certain window like you know 30 or 40 degrees going this way or that way then it's going to be considered on your path because they don't know whether you're going to turn out this way or whether you're going to turn out that way or if you're going to go straight. They just, if it's in this window, it's in your path. And it's going to have to be accounted for on takeoff performance. So when you do your takeoff performance, if you do have like an antenna like this, and this would be similar to like these NOTAMs, these antennas that we saw in the NOTAMs, if you had one of those within this window of your takeoff path, then you, you have to be able to show that you can clear that antenna or whatever obstacle it is by 100 feet once you cross over where it would be. Now, with normal performance, you know, typically those aren't going to be big issues. Like if, it, if you're, like I said, at sea level and you've got, you know, if you're not in a hot and high environment and you're getting good performance out of your engines, typically that's not a problem. And you'll notice that some airports that actually have these types of obstacles, most of them don't really have obstacles. Like you're going to notice that as you do performance for different airports, generally speaking, you don't normally have to deal with obstacles too much. But there are some airports, and I can even kind of show you what these specific obstacles are, and we'll talk about a few of them. But some airports do have obstacles, departures like this, where they have certain things, whether it be a building, antenna, a hill, a mountain, whatever it is that is in that takeoff, you know, degree window that has to be cleared. And if you um, have the right conditions, where going back to the hot and high conditions, like on a normal day where you're, where just you where you have you know lower temperatures and things like that. Clearing that obstacle may not be an issue at all, you, um, but if you get you know, to where it's really hot and if it's a higher elevation situation to begin with, then on that particular day, because of the conditions, even after you take off, those same conditions still affect your engine. So as you're climbing out on a hot and high day, you still can't climb as fast as you can on you know, a lower temperature, lower pressure, lower elevation type situation. So when you're even like in Denver, um, you have to be able to maintain like a certain climb degree angle as you climb out of Denver. So a lot of times in Denver and in any airport that's similar to Denver, um, your takeoff weight penalty will be um, well, your, your weight restriction will be related, like when you run your performance, you'll see that the takeoff penalty is actually being hit more for this, for like the first stage climb or the second stage climb than it even is for like the, the length of the runway. Um, to kind of make sense of that, it basically is, is when, when, a, when you're running performance, there's, there's obviously the runway portion, there's the takeoff roll, and the actual initial, you know, pulling off the ground. There's, there's that stage of performance, and then there's your first climb stage. So all of these things are looked at in different stages. There's the runway, there's your first stage climb, and then there's your second stage climb. And those are really the three main categories of looking at takeoff performance. So, in Denver, going back to this again, when when you have 
the really hot and high conditions in Denver, the, the weight penalty normally doesn't end up coming down to runway length. And so, like I said, longer the runway, the better performance you're going to get for that first, you know, for that first portion of your takeoff performance, which is just simply the runway length and that distance you have available to get the plane off the ground. Okay, but once you have the plane off the ground, you're now entering the second stage, which is called the first stage climb. Okay. That second stage of performance is, is also totally calculated independently. So all three stages you have to look at independently. Because it's one thing to get the plane off the ground, right? You have those conditions that are going to affect that. But now that you got the plane off the ground, you have your first stage climb. And you have to be able to show that with one engine, only one engine working, that you can still maintain a certain climb angle out of that airport. Now, if there happens to be obstacles along that path, that's just what makes it worse. Even without obstacles, you still have to be able to demonstrate a minimum climb angle. And anything that affects that minimum climb angle, that makes you drop below that minimum climb angle, is going to be directly related to a weight penalty. So if the temperature is high enough that once you take off, that your climb angle, like let's say you're supposed to maintain like 700 feet per minute climb. That's just, just throwing that out there, right? But let's say because it's so hot, the engine performance doesn't allow you to climb at 700 feet per minute. Let's say it only allows you to climb at 500 or 600 feet per minute. You're still climbing, but just not at the required climb. Well, what it's going to do then, the performance is going to, what it's going to make you reduce your weight on the plane to the point where you can do 700. Does that make sense? So it's going to make you take a weight penalty so that you can maintain the required climb angle out of the airport on that first stage. And like I said, that's without even putting obstacles into play. You throw an obstacle into this mixture and then you're having to take that obstacle into account and clear it by 100 feet. So sometimes that sometimes it will factor in and sometimes it won't. It really just depends on where the obstacle is in relation to your takeoff climb um, and where it is along, I should say, along how close it is, you know, from where you take off and where you're climbing out. <clears throat> but if anything on that, on your performance shows that your engine performance might not allow you to clear that obstacle by 100 feet, then it's going to, once again, same deal, it's going to make you reduce your weight to the point where you can clear it by 100 feet. So you can see all of these different things start to add up with takeoff performance that make you have to take weight penalties. Sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with the actual runway length itself. And the reason I was bringing up Denver in this example again is because I can have, there's days in Denver where I can plan, you know, like I said, every single runway there is minimum 12,000 feet and then there's the one that's 16,000, right? So just as an example, I can plan a takeoff for Denver on any one of the runways that's 12,000 feet and I'll get pretty much the same weight penalty, right? Because they're all 12,000 feet. So logic in my head tells me, well, what if I put it on the one that's 16,000? I've got an extra 4,000 feet to play with. I should get, I, you know, just by that logic, I should get better takeoff numbers, right? I should be able to carry more weight because I got an extra 4,000 feet to roll and take off. But I end up, I plug in that runway with the extra feet and I still get the exact same penalty that uh, for every, all the other runways, it's the same one. And the reason why is because you, you, if you look beyond it, you can see that the penalty is actually coming from the first stage or even some cases the second stage climb, not being able to maintain the rate of climb needed to get out of Denver. And so sometimes it has nothing to do with that runway. Like you can, you can have a 30,000 foot runway, it ain't going to make any difference at all.
because the 12,000 is sufficient enough to get you off the ground. It's just the problem is it doesn't matter where you're climbing. If the air is warm enough, you could be going any direction, any runway, you're not going to be able to perform engine-wise on your climb out. So that's your first stage climb, and then your second stage climb is a little bit less, but you can still see weight penalties on your second stage climb. So um, the reason why Denver always works is such a good example is because the climb going out of Denver because of the mountains to the west and things like that, you have to be able to climb at a higher rate. And it's even like here in St. George. If you climb, if you take off on runway, um, if you take off on runway um, one, which means you would be taking off going, you know, north, you're basically headed right towards Pine Valley Mountain over here. So Pine Valley Mountain for runway one in St. George, if you run takeoff performance, using runway one, you'll notice it that it is an obstacle departure. Like the, that mountain is taken into consideration when climbing out using runway one. If you use 19, you always get better performance, like if you need it. Now, it does. sometimes it comes down to the point where you, it doesn't make any difference. Even with a weight penalty, it still is well, you're still way above the weight you need anyway. So sometimes it doesn't play a, a factor, but in a worst case scenario where it's way hot in St. George and you've got a loaded plane and everything else, the optimal conditions <clears throat> are going to be to take off on runway 19 going south and then climb up, turn, and then go north. reason why is because going south out of St. George, there is obstacles to the south, but they're not as degrading performance-wise as going north and dealing with these mountains. So... Um, usually it doesn't make any difference though, you know, but like I said, you can get into situations where, you know, as long as the wind will allow you to, um, you would in some cases rather take off on runway 19 with a tailwind, you know, pushing you, which a tailwind is always going to make your performance worse if it's pushing you. You always want to take off into the wind because it helps you lift, right? But you could even take off on runway 19 with a tailwind rather than take off on runway one into into a headwind. But it, it, the difference being that the obstacle departure for the mountains makes it so much more difficult that you would rather take the tailwind penalty going south because it's less than going north for the obstacle penalties. So there's a lot of different penalties that you'll see on takeoff performance. Um, like I said, it could be runway length. It could be obstacle. It could be first stage climb degree, second stage climb degree. Um, it could be um, the obstacles. It could be tailwinds. It could be, you know, and later on we'll get into runway contamination where you've got wet runways, icy runways, snowy runways. All of those things obviously play into your takeoff performance. Um, we don't get too much into, like, runway contamination because runway contamination is held – and trained more specifically at an airline level because every airline treats those differently on how they treat contamination. So there's no point in really, I mean, we'll, we'll look at how SkyWest does it, but for this class and getting licensed, you don't necessarily need to learn runway contamination. You just need to know about it. But then that's just because every airline treats it differently. So they expect you to become specifically trained once you get to the airline ground school. So, um, but anyway, um, you just have to understand how performance works. Um, because as far as this part, the part that we've talked about, you know, the, the runway stage, first stage climb, second stage climb, those work the same regardless of where you're at with jet engines. So, um, a, a great example of of this uh, problem. So when we looked the other day at, uh, at Juno, if you guys remember when we were looking at Juno, that is a great example of, of uh, an obstacle departure um, issue that uh, really affects performance on the airplane. It, in our case, it, it, it affects it from not only the performance of the obstacle departure, but also the, uh, you know, just us not having the required navigation stuff to be able to do different procedures there out of Juno. So that's another part. But if you take off um, 
I believe on runway, um, whatever the opposite of eight is, it's the opposite of eight. Um, on a compass, I can't remember. Anyway, 26, I guess, maybe. Yeah, 9 and 27, 8, 26. Okay, so if you take off on runway 26 in Juno, um, you end up going right into that mountain that I kind of, for those of you that were here that could see, you know, that mountain is like 10 times closer than this one is. So it affects it a lot more. So typically you can really only take off, if you want to get good performance out of Juno, you can really only take off going the other direction for us to get good you know, weights and things like that. Otherwise you take massive weight penalties and that's because of the mountain. Um, a really kind of annoying example of this would be Williston, North Dakota. Um, Williston, their runway up there is runway 11 and well, it's one runway, but the one end is 11, the other end is 29. So if you're in Williston and you have to take off on runway 29, um, 29 has close to the end of the runway or just a little bit off the end of the runway, there's a telephone line. Okay, so this is even something as stupid as a telephone line, okay? It just goes across. Just a normal telephone pole, you know? I mean, it could be like that one out there, you can see. Something like that. But, but it happens to be near the end of the runway, and you've got to clear that by 100 feet. And so it's so close to the end of the runway, though, that clearing that thing by 100 feet, even, even on normal conditions out of Williston, not even a situation where it's, high and, you know, it's not high elevation and it's, you know, if it's not hot, I mean, Williston is always known for being cold anyway. So even in good weather and pressure conditions, temperature and pressure conditions, um, to clear that thing by 100 feet, it makes it take, the 200 obviously is the only thing we fly there, but it, it makes the CRJ 200 take huge performance penalties, huge, like you, to the point where you can't even take anybody with you, like on the plane, like maybe five or six people, it's that bad. Mm -hmm. So we get into situations in Williston where it gets really windy and the wind is favoring 2-9 and if you get into that situation where the wind is favoring 2-9, um, we pretty much just get stranded there. Like in some cases it's so bad that the plane can't even calculate performance at all. That's with no passengers. That's like literally taking it empty and just the crew, you know, like a repo. Like the, the, the system we use to calculate data sometimes will just, it'll return an error message. It'll say unable to calculate performance. And that means you can't use it if that happens. So the other thing restriction wise is we cannot take off in a tailwind of more than 10 knots, okay? That's a, that's a restriction just based on the airplane type. So you could get into different airplane types like at other airlines that might be able to do more than 10 knot tailwinds, but you can't, for SkyWest, you cannot take off or land with more than a 10 knot tailwind. So the problem with Williston is when you get a really windy day and the wind favors runway 29, you would still, even in that environment, you would still prefer taking off on runway 11 all the way up to a nine knot tailwind or all the way up even to the max 10 knot tailwind rather than take off on 29. Taking that penalty for the 10 knot tailwind is always going to be way, way, way less than taking the penalty for the obstacle on 2-9. So the only problem in Williston, though, is if you get too windy to where you can't depart on 2-9 because of the obstacle, but then you have more than a 10-knot tailwind on 11, that's how you end up getting stranded there is because you can't take off at all on either runway. So... Um, it becomes. Have they, really that or that? they have, yeah. 
they have at length. In fact, I remember dealing with this runway all the way back to when I started at Great Lakes because um, originally when I started um, dispatching at Great Lakes, they were the only ones that flew into Williston and um, Dickinson up there. Mm -hmm. And even some of these other places like Jamestown, Devil's Lake, all of these airports that we fly to now, it's like I feel like Great Lakes has just followed me here. But a lot of these airports we fly to all used to be the same airports I used to dispatch to when I was first started dispatching at Great Lakes. Scott, like uh, Pueblo, Hayes, all of these airports we go to now. Waterloo, the one that we just added. Um, anyway, they all used to be Great Lakes, and Great Lakes was the only one that went there. But back in that day, I remember dealing with that same obstacle departure at Williston. And then once we started flying to Williston, um, I remember that being the first thing I thinking of. I wonder if they moved that damn telephone line. <laughs> and sure enough, now it's still there. They, they're actually building a new airport in Williston, I believe. Oh. It's completely... Telephone bowl green. <laughs> yeah. Different side of the city, I think, even too. But anyway, yeah. As of now, though, it's there. But that's just an example of an obstacle departure that can really affect takeoff performance. Um, another one that maybe some of you guys have seen is in San Diego. Um, San Diego, just a one runway environment, runway 9 slash 27. Um, but San Diego always likes to land on runway 27. And typically, because it's a coastal airport during the day, the wind normally always will favor. You'll notice that coastal airports almost always land one direction during the day, in one direction at night, and that's because sea breeze, land breeze. Night, it's going one way. Day, it's going the other way. So during the day, San Diego typically is always, you know, your sea breeze environment. So you land going to the west, towards the sea, into the wind, and land on 2-7. Um, now, as you guys also probably have seen, coastal airports, all like once the sun goes down, you always get the issue where like fog will move in or all of a sudden like your San Diego's, your Carlsbad back in the day, um, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, Santa Maria, Monterey, Arcata, any of those airports, you're, they're susceptible to suddenly just getting fogged in, going down to a quarter mile. As soon as the sun sets, the temperature drops, the dew point, temperature dew point hit, fog starts, you get the land breeze now. It's anyway, it's all of those things that just suddenly come into play. But in San Diego, like I said, they like to land on 2-7 during the day. Um, but at night, they will, they, they'll stay on 2-7 even with a tailwind as long as they can, even into the night. If Even at nighttime when when conditions allow, they'll still land on 2-7 with a tailwind rather than land on 9 um, and take off on 9. And the reason is because runway 9 has a huge – have you guys, any of you guys been to San Diego? Um, there's a huge seven-story parking garage just off of the end of runway 9 going towards the city. If you're landing on 2-7, you come in right over the top of it and then and land. Yeah, so, but if you have to take off on um, 9, let me see if I can just bring it up and show you guys a good picture of it. But, it, it you know, San Diego is obviously a popular place to go. So if you ever go down there, take a look at this because it's kind of cool, to, at least once you know the reason, you know. It's also a cool place to uh, plane watch at. <laughs> San Diego, here we come. Okay. So here we are, San Diego. I don't know if it'll let me go any. Less than that. Okay. 
anyway this parking garage right here and it really if you're looking at it from the just the naked eye perspective you would think that well, a plane should never have an issue being a thousand feet above that thing let alone a hundred right yeah it's just that people are used to looking at it from two engines operating yeah two engines operating that is not going to ever be a problem and if you're watching this from a spectator standpoint you know you're always seeing two engine performance when you're watching you know unless you happen to see uh, an engine failure while you're out there spectating um, you're not going to probably ever see any situation where the planes taking off going on runway 9 take off and uh, don't clear that thing by like 2,000 feet <coughs> but if you happen to see um, an engine failure one of the things of with an engine failure is that you can't climb you know you can't climb as good and so you you know, and I don't know how dramatic it would be or not with an engine failure, but they basically say that, you know, taking off on runway nine, you got to clear that thing by 100 feet. Um, but then you also have, you know, your obstacles over here in the city too, you know, because these are, if you look at the window of the takeoff plane here, you know, I mean, they typically aren't allowed to turn out over the city anyway, but... I think even some of these buildings over here are taken into consideration as, you know, obstacle departures um, that can affect performance. So if you flip this thing around, that's, you know, you go this way, you don't got any problems. So, but as you come in, I'm going to just kind of as you are coming in here to land you can see that parking garage there seems like more of an issue when you land than anything else but um, the other thing too is do you guys see this big long area of the runway here that is just these arrows you notice that the runway, so, so normally a runway just looks like this, like the end of it looks like this here, like how it starts and ends on either end. But you'll notice in San Diego, you have this, this is called a displaced threshold. And you'll look at this later when we look at the runway markings and stuff. But going back to that thing in... Um, when we were looking at the the takeoff distance available, the the um, stop distance available, landing distance available. So this is something where, like, if you looked at San Diego's chart, you would see totally different numbers. The landing distance available. So this threshold here is basically saying, so when the planes land, they cannot land on this part. They have to land down here where you see these, you know, the touchdown zone, which is right down in here. Um, this, for landing purposes, this, that threshold right there, those, which is the white lines that go across the runway, like all the way across like this, that's the threshold. So that, for landing purposes, is considered the end of the runway. So if you were to land down here, it would mean that you're landing not on the runway at all. Now, if you're taking off, a plane that's taking off can come down and can turn off, and they can take off starting right here on this very back arrow. And they can use all of this runway for takeoff, but for landing, it's only this part. And that is because of the parking garage. This whole displaced threshold is having to move clear up the runway because of this parking garage. So if the plane, that means that this thing is blocking the landing descent angle, so as you come down, and if you were trying to land right here, you know, like if this was a normal runway, you would see the threshold right here, and then you would have the landing touchdown zone right in here. But because of this parking garage, you come down, it would be way too close to that parking garage on landing. 
um, it would come too close to it. So that's why this whole runway touchdown zone has to be moved clear down here is just because of this one parking garage. Kind of an interesting concept, but... Um, but yeah, so the other thing about San Diego, too, is that the ILS is um, is to runway 9. It's, the ILS is only coming from the other direction. So this is kind of another thing that relates to the weather, but when San Diego is in conditions that that would require an ILS approach, Typically, that's going to be fog and things like that in San Diego, kind of those same conditions. Like we said, the sun goes down, the temperature goes down, and you start to get fog because temperature dew point meet. Well, that's usually because of the wind shifting as well. So you'll notice in San Diego that they only have an ILS approach to runway 9, and that's because when those conditions exist, it's almost always a land breeze going out, and it's that fog situation at night where the wind is reversed going the other way. So if you're landing on runway 27, you never need an ILS approach because that almost always means that the, you know, there's a sea breeze and the weather's good if there's a sea breeze typically. So it's kind of interesting that you'll yeah, notice that. My first non-revening experience, everything canceled due to fog. Oh yeah. Like the day before I was leaving, Fun. Yeah, I, I bet. So most of these coastal airports, you'll notice that the ILS approaches are going to be to the to the wet to the western, or I should say, heading west, essentially. Uh, and that's any of them. You go up and down the coast, um, Santa Barbara. San Luis Obispo, Santa Maria, all the ones we named already, all of those ILS approaches are going to be to those runways that don't, um, that are, you know, you're from your, your landing facing west. Same conditions, though. Um, anyway, so that's kind of takeoff performance kind of in a nutshell. The... Um, the big thing that we talk about on um, en route performance is we have the same restrictions that are going to apply to us when we move to the en route environment. In the en route environment, um, we deal with um, a few different types of, uh, we're really just two different types of possible situations. Um, it, we're still basing everything off of a, potentially having an engine fail while we're at cruise. So now we're looking at, we're just at cruise, right? We're up at 30,000 feet, 37,000 feet, wherever we're cruising, whatever the cruising altitude is. And then we assume that an engine fails at that altitude, okay? When an engine fails at cruise, what's going to happen is the airplane is going to start to naturally drift down because it doesn't have that second engine performance. So you're going to start losing altitude. And there's nothing you can do about that because in order to maintain 36,000 feet, 37,000 feet, in order to maintain those altitudes, you are going to have, you have to have two engines operating. So if you lose an engine, the plane will just by itself, it will lose altitude um, regardless of what you do. So now when we are cruising around at cruise level, the restrictions are a little bit different um, because we have to clear our obstacles in those situations by a higher altitude. So you have your, the whole thing we just talked about with takeoff performance, you got to clear obstacles by 100 feet. In the en route environment, you have to clear obstacles by a thousand feet. Okay, usually that's not a problem, you know. Uh, and if you're in mountainous terrain, you have to clear them by two thousand feet. So that's kind of your limitation. So 
you really, when you look at in route, you're looking at two different things. Am I in mountainous terrain or non-mountainous terrain? That's the first thing you want to look at. Mountainous, non-mountainous. If you're in non-mountainous, 1,000 feet. All obstacles. What's going to be an obstacle if you're at 30,000 feet, though? Just mountains, right? That's the only possible thing. So that's why you're just distinguishing mountainous, non-mountainous when you're at that when you're at that altitude. So if you are non-mountainous, it's 1,000 feet. If you're in mountainous terrain, it is 2,000 feet. So, um, and that's just the in-route clearance zones? Correct. So the biggest thing really, in fact, the only time you ever see issues with, uh, gosh, this stupid fly. There's like one fly in here. It's just hanging out over here. Um, the only time you ever see issues with in route performance where you lose an engine is only typically if you're in mountainous terrain. Um, what what has to happen if you are in not just to give you give you an idea of how it works with the en route? Um, you get up to your cruising altitude, um, you lose an engine. At that point, you have to be able to demonstrate, the FAR in this case is, you have to be able to demonstrate that you can continue all the way to your destination on one engine, taking into account the fact that you're going to drift down in altitude. Now, if you only have one engine operating, you're going to typically drift down to somewhere, and like I said, it all depends on the temperature at that altitude and everything else, but more or less, you're going to drift down to somewhere, you know, around 20,000 feet or, you know, between 15 and 25,000 feet, just as a window, right? So if you are in non-mountainous terrain and you lose an engine, if you're going Denver to Jamestown, since we're just continue with our Jamestown stuff, right? If you're going Denver to Jamestown, that entire route is going to be considered non-mountainous terrain. And you, if you lose an engine, you just be able, need to be able to demonstrate that you will clear all obstacles along that route by 1,000 feet. That's not going to be any problem. Even if you lose an engine and drift clear down to 10,000 feet, you're still going to be well, well more than 1,000 feet above all obstacles all the way to Jamestown. In fact, pretty much from Denver east, that entire part of the United States is all going to be considered non-mountainous, even over the Appalachians and, you know, the Ozarks and whatever other mountains are out there, whatever hills, I should say. Um, those are all non-mountainous. The only time you have really mountainous terrain is going to be, you know, your Rockies. Your, I mean, most of the stuff in the west, obviously, is going to be your mountainous stuff west of Denver. Um, so... If you're going to Denver, Jamestown, lose an engine, not going to be a problem. You could continue all the way to Jamestown, clear everything by 1,000 feet, not a problem. Now, if you are going Denver to, let's say, Helena, and you lose an engine on that route, then you're probably going to have problems. Um, you have to be able to demonstrate, in that case, that you will clear everything by 2,000 feet. But you have to take into account the plane is going to start drifting down. And what I want to show here, I'm going to draw it so that it's part of the official record that Ashley can review later. Um, Sorry. <laughs> the fly came over and I whacked it. And I <laughs> <laughs> Let me first just see if there's a, just a good Google image that'll that'll just show us. What is this thing? I like the whole thing. Just see if this shows it. Got a good one here. Yeah, that one's not a good one because that's showing 1,000. Okay. 
Well, let me just continue to look here. Since this will be quicker than drawing, and probably more visual, visually appealing. Uh, we'll just use this as well. Even though this uh, doesn't necessarily it'll work for I guess what we're looking at here. So got a plane here flying over mountainous terrain. They lose an engine right here and then they start drifting down. So the altitude at which you drift down to and the altitude that you can maintain with one engine is called your drift down ceiling. Depending on where your drift down ceiling falls, you start to kind of get in. I mean, let's say your drift down ceiling is 15,000 feet, okay? Especially when you're flying over the mountains, things like that, your performance isn't necessarily as good. For the same reasons that Denver is a, a low performance airport for engines, it's the same reason as flying over the mountains near Denver is also not that great for performance either. So if you're on a really nice warm day where even the air is even warm up into the upper atmosphere where you're flying, if the, if the air is above ice, and you'll see when we start flight planning, even when you're planning a flight at 37,000 feet, you're often going to be using ISA plus 35 and ISA plus 40 charts even at that altitude because it's so much more warmer than what it should be in the upper air. So it's common to still see really warm temperatures, albeit they're still negative and really cold. It's a lot, it's still, you know, a lot warmer than it should be at that, at that altitude. So you'll drift down basically is what's happening. But if you drift down like over the Rocky Mountains, you know, there's several peaks, you know, in the Rockies that are, you know, get up into the 14,000s. And if you're drifting down to 15,000 feet, you're not going to be able to maintain that 2,000 foot mountainous clearance, basically. So what happens is you can get into a situation um, and kind of the, the more of the what I wanted to demonstrate um, from a drawing perspective was that a lot of times you can get up into the air, go over a mountain range and have an engine fail and then drift down. Okay, now the problem is you lost that engine, you've drifted down, there's a mountain range behind you that you already went over, and there's a mountain range in front of you that you still got to go to or over, you know. So what happens is you get into a situation where, and I can, this part I can't draw. You know, let's, so like this part where he's drifted down, well, let's say, you know, there's, you know, another, you know, mountain range over here that he's got to go over. You get caught in between these two ranges here where you cannot show that you have that 2,000 foot clearance. So what happens in that situation is if, you, first of all, going back to the whole engine thing, if you lose an engine, what's the procedure? You got to divert to the nearest suitable airport. That's the FAR, right? So that's already what you're going to have to do. It's not like you're going to lose an engine and then have to prove that we could still go all the way to L.A., you know. You're not going to do that anyway, right? You could maybe in some situations, or if you're going to Denver, Jamestown, you could go all the way to Jamestown with one engine. We could do it, but you got to divert to the nearest suitable airport. And so when you're going over mountainous terrain and you drift down, you then are going to clearly have to divert to a suitable airport that's between these two mountain ranges. So what happens a lot of the time, especially in the summer, on these really warm days, you end up having to do what are called drift down alternates. Um, even on a perfect weather, nice clear day, you have to do what's called a drift down alternate. And that's basically saying that um, there's several points along your route that are basically saying like, let's say that you started out over here in Denver, right? And you're ultimately going over here. You can see clear over here to Salt Lake. 
here's your route between Denver and this point right here, which would be the highest. So you've got, you, you end up having to divide your route into different sections. So this from here to here would be like, you know, A. And then from here to here would be B. And then from here to, you know, from here to Salt Lake would be C. So if you consider that you end up having to divide your route into different sections here, and if your engine fails somewhere in point A or along route the segment A, you could always just return to Denver because you could always, if you, as long as you don't get the mountains behind you, you could your alternate, your drift down alternate. In this case, if the engine failed in segment A, would be turn around, return to Denver. Okay. Now, if you get over this mountain range, and then your engine fails between, you know, well, in section B, between this mountain range and this mountain range you cannot return to Denver because you can't turn around and clear this mountain. You cannot continue to Salt Lake because you got you can't clear this mountain. So you have to list on the on the dispatch release a drift down alternate that is somewhere between these two mountain ranges or somewhere that you could technically drift down and not have to clear by 2000 feet and land at an airport because the procedure, like we said, is going to be divert to the nearest suitable airport. And uh, with one engine being gone, it's going to have to be somewhere in between those two mountain ranges. So, you know, you end up having to go to, say, I don't know, maybe Grand Junction would work in this case. I don't know. That's just throwing it out there on the Denver-Salt Lake route. Maybe, you know, maybe Hayden, maybe... What qualifies as suitable? Do they have to have maintenance available, or is it just basically that you just have to be able to land there and get people up? So, funny you should ask, because I know it's an ADX question, I believe, too, right? Mm -hmm. So, suitable really just comes down to what it's, it's what you define, what the dispatcher and the PIC define as being suitable. Um, that being that you've got, you know, enough run obviously runway like it has to be obviously an, an airport that can handle your aircraft right like performance wise <laughs> you got to be able to land there safely it's got to be you know some if it, if let's say it's a med med medical medical emergency if it's a medical emergency the, i mean those the situation suitable is going to change depending on the situation but medical emergency um, you might go somewhere further because it uh, it might have better rather than having to transport them exactly. You might have better access to a medical personnel meeting the plane, or even better services. Just generally speaking, as a hospital, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, if it's mechanical, you know, if you're right next to um, a uh, hold on, my wife. I know when she calls three times that it's probably got to answer because she knows I'm teaching. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're almost done. So. Sure. Let me call you when I get done. Bye bye. Okay. So, um, um, so anyway, so suitable will change just depending on the situation. Um, of what you're having to deal with at that time. So mechanical, I mean, it could be that, you know, typically suitable is not going to be the airport that's right underneath you, by the way, I'm, because you got to descend down. And by the time you descend down, you're another hundred miles, you know, past that airport. So suitable will change. It's really just will depend on the suitability of handling the passengers, suitability from a maintenance standpoint, suitability from a medical standpoint. Um, performance standpoint, whether it has a jet bridge, whether it has, I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of things that you could technically throw into that. This was, this is what makes it suitable type category. Is it so, neutral or is it more just the captain goes where he wants? Well, it depends. Some captains just tell you where they're going and then other captains will just leave it up to you. 
typically I would say most of the, the majority of the time, unless it is an absolute emergency, like they lost an engine and like mechanical emergency, typically, typically they're going to um, always let the dispatcher make the decision unless it's something that they think doesn't have time to even tell the dispatcher that's just like so immediate that they're just choosing and they're just going. It doesn't matter. That's It's usually pretty cut and dry between those two things, though. So. If it's something they have time to think about, they'll usually always talk to the dispatcher. Um, if it's something that they don't think, and even on medical situations, it's like, you know, like we'll often get ACARs that say, Oh, well, uh, we might divert because this passenger is having issues. We'll see how they do, you know, and then later on they divert. But if it's something that's, like, dire and, like, right now, then I'll just usually send them. I just diverting here, medical, you know, and then you don't find out anything until they land because they usually won't respond. So, anyway, so you got to list, list drift down alternates. Um along the route sometimes due to the terrain along the route and having to account for losing an engine. So when we talk about en route performance, there's um, you have what's called method one and then there's method two. So between those two methods, is how you do your drift down. So method one is going to be um, typically your non-terrain type flying where you um, you can demonstrate on your flight plan that you can take off and go all the way to the destination and clear all obstacles by more than a thousand feet with one engine operating. That's method one, okay? Drift down. And this is, I should go back and preface this, these two drift downs you definitely need to know. So method one, take off from your origin, go all the way to your destination, clear all obstacles by a thousand feet with one engine in up. You can show that, that you can do that. That's that's using method one. If you end up having to use method two, that's where you are showing that you can fly your entire route by clearing all obstacles by 2,000 feet and potentially, and you may have to use drift down alternates. Along the route, but you basically, if you're using method two, it ends up being that, you know, section one of your flight, you have, if you lose an engine, you return to your origin. Section B of your flight, you might have to list, you know, Grand Junction or Montrose or something, that you list an alternate for that section of your flight. And then section C would be, if you lose an engine, you continue to your destination because there's no terrain in front of it. So in this case, like going back to this example, your alternate, your drift down alternate for section A would be your origin of Denver. Section B would be something like Grand Junction or Montrose. And then section C drift down alternate would just be your destination of Salt Lake. So does it just depend on the obstacles, how big those sections It just depends are? on how big they are, whether you can account for being able to clear them with one engine in op, and then where you are in regards to your route. So it's basically, we'll just say, if you are between point A and point B, this is your alternate. If you're between point B and point C, this is your alternate. And then point C and D, this is your alternate. That's, that's basically how it looks on the release. And sometimes you have multiple alternates. Like if you, you know, if you're doing like a Callus Bell to Denver flight on a really hot day in the summer, you'll see that you end up needing, you'll end up having like Bozeman as a drift down alternate. You'll end up having um, 
like Gillette as a, as another drift down alternate, and then like Casper as another drift down alternate, and then then finally Denver will be like your last point. So it just kind of shows different spots along the route that you would divert to if you lost an engine. Now we'll look at the weather requirements for alternates later, but anytime you have drift down alternates, you still have to also check the notams, make sure that they meet the weather requirements and things like that as well. So it uh, it gets, you know, kind of, you know, you just, it gets to the point where if you have those, you just need to remember to check them, but we'll uh, look at that stuff later. But yeah, so that in, in the nutshell is kind of your en route performance. Those are really the two big things that you're looking at for en route performance. Um, landing performance, there really isn't much of a restriction if you lose an engine landing. When you look at your landing overall as you're going down, you're pretty much not using your engines anyway. So if you lost one, you're already, you, I mean, if you're already on descent and you lost an engine, I mean, you would already be doing what you're doing. You would be descending and landing, right? So you really don't have restrictions like performance restrictions. The only types of performance restrictions you ever have on landing would be um, some sort of an MEL on the plane um, that, like if you were in, in, we'll look at, like I said, the, like I, I know I always say we'll look at this later with flight planning because you're going to see everything with flight planning, obviously. So a lot of the, these concepts will come full circle when we do flight planning. But if you had an MEL, say, on like your anti-skid system, um, that's going to usually potentially give you a landing re weight restriction. So your whole flight might be good. Your takeoff, you don't have any restrictions. Your in route, no restrictions. And then your landing, you might get a restriction because you have an anti-skid MEL that requires you to have a much longer landing distance because of that MEL that you, you know, you might be going into a short runway airport and, uh, you, you know, you might have an issue there just because of an MEL or the other types of landing restrictions would be contamination on the runway, which we're also going to look at. <coughs> if an engine fails on your landing performance or on your landing portion of the flight, it's not going to really do much to you because when they, at the point that they're at cruise altitude and they start their descent, they typically take the plane and idle back to zero power on both engines anyway. So you're not even usually using any engines when you're descending and going all the way in and landing. The only time that they normally power up on descent is if ATC makes them level off at a certain altitude. Typically they like to start descending and then never stop descending. They just gradually descend all the way until they land. In some airports, depending on ATC and the traffic and stuff, sometimes ATC will stop them and then just make them stay at that altitude. If they have to stop at an altitude, then they will have the power back up to maintain that altitude. But then once they start descending again, they just pull back and they let the plane float down. And the only time they normally power up from, unless they stop somewhere along the descent, the, only, the next time that they're even going to power up is right before they land. And that's just to set the airport or the airplane. Once they put the flaps down and the gear down, they'll power the plane up to maintain like 140 because they if you if you remember back when I was saying V1 is normally around 140 ish well when they land you'll notice that the landing reference speed is normally right about the same speed as V1 right in that same ballpark as V1 to V2 between 140 and 145 or like 136 to like 145 that's kind of your landing speed window and so they like to maintain that speed so that if something happened right when they were going to land, they're already going the speed that they need to just climb. If they needed to just crank it back up, wheels up, and then start climbing, they're going the speed that they would need to go to take off. So it's kind of just the safety precaution. But that's the only other time they really are going to power up is you'll notice that they put the flaps down, and if you fly anytime soon, just try and pay attention to this. Flaps will go down to 45, gear will go down, and then you'll hear the power go up. And that's so that they can maintain 140-ish, and then they'll touch down going about 140. 
that's what they will normal speed. So, um, but that speed, they could be going slower if they wanted to, but the problem is, is that if something happened that required them to go around or to not land, then they could power back up, but if they're not going fast enough, they're still going to probably hit the runway and not be able to, you know, go the speed they need to. So those are the only types of restrictions you're going to see on landing is is uh, an MEL typically or some sort of runway contamination. So there's not really much to cover with landing. It's just that most of it will be covered when you see flight planning. So like I said, and we don't really get into contamination too much, but just know that that's really the only thing that you'll ever really see is those types of restrictions because landing is not based off of engine power it's based off of not having power and just being able to stop so any questions on performance stuff and that's just kind of it in a nutshell and you're going to see it obviously over and over and over but that's how it works that you know there's a lot more stuff on takeoff there's just a couple of things on in route and then really nothing on landing so that's kind of uh, what you're looking at but if nobody has any questions, then we are done. Uh, why didn't we have a, a boss yesterday? Oh, because I covered it today. Oh, okay. Yeah. I uh, was going to get in there.